Act One of The Second Mrs. Tanqueray by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Second Mrs. Tanqueray, a play in four acts by Arthur Wing Pinero. The Persons of the Play Aubrey Tanqueray. Read by Todd. Miss Paula Ray, the second Mrs. Tanqueray, read by Beth Thomas. Aline, read by Lian Yao. Kaylee Drummle, read by Thomas Peter. Mrs. Cortelion, read by Sonia. Captain Hugh Ardale, read by Jason in Panama. Doctor Gordon Jane, M.D., read by Son of the Exiles. Frank Misquith, QCMP, read by Philip Gould. Sir George Oread Bart, read by Alan Mapstone. Lady Oread, read by T. J. Burns. Morse, read by Jesse Percival. Servant, read by Roger Moline. Narrated by Abai. The present day. The scene of the first act is laid at Mr. Tanqueray's room, number 2X, the Albany, in the month of November. The occurrences of the succeeding acts take place at his house, Hirecombe, near Willowmere, Surrey, during the early part of the following year. The first act. Aubrey Tanqueray's chambers in the Albany. A richly and tastefully decorated room, elegantly and luxuriously furnished. On the right, a large pair of doors opening into another room. On the left, at the further end of the room, a small door leading to a bedchamber. A circular table is laid for a dinner for four persons, which has now reached the stage of dessert and coffee. Everything in the apartment suggests wealth and refinement. The fire is burning brightly. Aubrey Tanqueray, Miss Quith, and Jane are seated at the dinner table. Aubrey is forty-two, handsome, winning in manner, his speech and bearing retaining some of the qualities of young manhood. Miss Quith is about forty-seven, genial and portly. Jane is a year or two Miss Quith's senior, soft-speaking and precise, in appearance a type of the prosperous town physician. Morse, Aubrey's servant, places a little cabinet of cigars and the spirit lamp on the table beside Aubrey and goes out. Aubrey, it is a pleasant yet dreadful fact to contemplate, but it's nearly fifteen years since I first dined with you. You lodged in Piccadilly in those days over a hat shop. Jane, I met you at that dinner, and Cayley Drummle. Yes, yes. What a pity it is that Cayley isn't here tonight. Confound the old gossip. His empty chair has been staring us in the face all through dinner. I ought to have told Morse to take it away. Odd his sending no excuse. I'll walk round to his lodgings later on and ask after him. I'll go with you. So will I. Aubrey, opening the cigar cabinet. Doctor? It's useless to tempt you, I know. Frank? Miss Quith and Aubrey smoke. I particularly wished Cayley Drummle to be one of us tonight. You two fellows and Cayley are my closest, my best friends. My dear Aubrey. I rejoice to hear you say so. And I wanted to see the three of you round this table. You can't guess the reason. You desired to give us a most excellent dinner. Obviously. Aubrey, hesitatingly. Well, I... Glancing at the clock. Cayley won't turn up now. Hmm, hardly. Then you too shall hear it. Doctor, Frank, this is the last time we are to meet in these rooms. The last time? You're going to leave the Albany? Yes. You've heard me speak of a house I built in the country years ago, haven't you? In Surrey. 
Well, when my wife died, I cleared out of that house and let it. I think of trying the place again. But you'll go raving mad if you ever find yourself down there alone. Ah, but I shan't be alone. And that's what I wanted to tell you. I'm going to be married. Going to be married? Married? Yes, tomorrow. Tomorrow? You take my breath away. My dear fellow, I... I... Of course I congratulate you. And... And so do I. Heartily. Thanks. Thanks. There is a moment or two of embarrassment. Er, uh, um, this is an excellent cigar. Um, your coffee is remarkable. Look here. I dare say you two old friends think this treatment very strange, very unkind. So I want you to understand me. I know a marriage often cools friendships. What's the usual course of things? A man's engagement is given out, he is congratulated, complimented upon his choice. The church is filled with troops of friends, and he goes away happily to a chorus of good wishes. He comes back, sets up house in town or country, and thinks to resume the old associations, the old companionships. My dear Frank, my dear good doctor, it's very seldom that it can be done. Generally, a worm has begun to eat its way into those hearty, unreserved, prenuptial friendships. A damnable constraint sets in and acts like a wasting disease. And so, believe me, in nine cases out of ten, a man's marriage severs for him more close ties than it forms. Well, my dear Aubrey, I earnestly hope. I know what you're going to say, Frank. I hope so, too. In the meantime, let's face dangers. I've reminded you of the usual course of things, but my marriage isn't even the conventional sort of marriage likely to satisfy society. Now, Cayley's a bachelor, but you two men have wives. Uh, by the by, my love to Mrs. Misquith and Mrs. Jane when you get home. Don't forget that. Well, your wives may not like the lady I'm going to marry. Aubrey. Forgive me for suggesting that the lady you are going to marry may not like our wives, mine at least. I beg your pardon, Frank. Quite so. Then I must go the way my wife goes. Come, come. Frey, don't let us anticipate that either side will be called upon to make such a sacrifice. Yes, yes, let us anticipate it and let us make up our minds to have no slow bleeding to death of our friendship. We'll end a pleasant chapter here tonight, and after tonight start afresh. When my wife and I settle down at Willowmere, it's possible that we shall all come together. But if this isn't to be, for heaven's sake, let us recognize that it is simply because it can't be, and not wear hypocritical faces and suffer and be wretched. Doctor, Frank, holding out his hands, one to Misquith, the other to Jane. Good luck to all of us. But, but do I understand we are to ask nothing? Not even the lady's name, Aubrey? The lady, my dear Frank, belongs to the next chapter, and in that her name is Mrs. Aubrey Tangeray. Jane, raising his coffee cup. Then, in an old-fashioned way, I propose a toast. Aubrey, Frank, I give you the next chapter. They drink the toast, saying, The next chapter. Doctor, find a comfortable chair. Frank, you too. As we're going to turn out by and by, let me scribble a couple of notes now while I think of them. Certainly. Certainly. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. It might slip my memory when I get back. Aubrey sits at a writing table at the other end of the room and writes. Jane to Misquith in a whisper. Frank. Misquith quietly leaves his chair and sits nearer to Jane. What is all this? Simply a morbid crank of Aubrey's with regard to antenuptial acquaintances? Hmm. Did you notice one expression he used? 
Let me think. My marriage is not even the conventional sort of marriage likely to satisfy society. Bless me, yes. What does that suggest? That he has a particular, rather than a general, reason for anticipating estrangement from his friends, I'm afraid. A horrible mesalliance. A dairy maid who has given him a glass of milk during a day's hunting? Or a little anemic shop girl? Frank, I'm utterly wretched. My dear Jane, speaking in absolute confidence, I have never been more profoundly depressed in my life. Morse enters. Mr. Drummle. Cayley Drummle enters briskly. He is a neat little man of about five and forty, in manner bright, airy, debonair, but with an undercurrent of seriousness. Morse retires. I'm in disgrace. Nobody realizes that more thoroughly than I do. Where's my host? Aubrey, who has risen. Cayley! Drummle shaking hands with him. Don't speak to me till I have tendered my explanation. A harsh word from anybody would unman me. Miss Quith and Jane shake hands with Drummle. Have you dined? No, unless you call a bit of fish, a cutlet, and a pancake dining. Cayley, this is disgraceful. Fish, a cutlet, and a pancake will require a great deal of explanation. Especially the pancake. My dear friend, your case looks miserably weak. Hear me, hear me. Now then. Come. Well. It so happens that tonight I was exceptionally early in dressing for dinner. For which dinner? The fish and cutlet? For this dinner, of course. Really, Frank. At a quarter to eight, in fact, I found myself trimming my nails with ten minutes to spare. Just then, enter my man with a note. Would I hasten, as fast as cab could carry me, to old Lady Oriot in Bruton Street? Sad trouble. Now recollect, please, I had ten minutes on my hands. Old Lady Oriot was a very dear friend of my mother's, and was in some distress. Cayley, come to the fish and cutlet. Yes, yes, yes and, and the, the pancake. pancake. Upon my word. Well, the scene in Bruton Street beggars description. The women servants looked scared, the men drunk, and there was poor old Lady Oriot on the floor of her boudoir like Queen Bess among her pillows. What's the matter? Drummle to everybody. You know George Oriot? Yes. I've met him. Well, he's a thing of the past. Not dead? Certainly, in the worst sense. Well, he's married Mabel Hervey. What? It's true. This morning, the poor mother showed me his letter. A dozen curt words, and some of those ill-spelt. Miss Quith, walking up to the fireplace. I'm very sorry. Pardon my ignorance. Who was Mabel Hervey? You don't... Oh, of course not. Miss Hervey... Lady Oriad, as she now is, was a lady who would have been, perhaps has been, described in the reports of the police or the divorce court as an actress. Had she belonged to a lower stratum of our advanced civilization, she would, in the event of judicial inquiry, have defined her calling with equal justification as that of a dressmaker. To do her justice, she is a type of a class which is immortal. Physically, by the strange caprice of creation, curiously beautiful. Mentally, she lacks even the strength of deliberate viciousness. Paint her portrait, it would symbolize a creature perfectly patrician. Lance a vein of her superbly modeled arm, you would get the poorest vin ordinaire. Her affections, emotions, impulses, her very existence, a burlesque. Flaxen, five and twenty, and feebly frolicsome, anybody's, in less gentle society I should say, everybody's property. That doctor was Miss Hervey, who is the new Lady Oriot. Dost thou like the picture? Very good, Cayley. Bravo. Aubrey, 
laying his hand on Drummle's shoulder. You'd scarcely believe it, Jane, but none of us really know anything about this lady. Our gay young friend here, I suspect, least of all. Aubrey, I applaud your chivalry. And perhaps you'll let me finish a couple of letters which Frank and Jane have given me leave to write. Returning to the writing table. Ring for what you want, like a good fellow. Aubrey resumes his writing. Miss Quith to Drummle. Still, the fish and cutlet remain unexplained. Oh, the poor old one was so weak that I insisted upon her taking some food and felt there was nothing for it but to sit down opposite her. The fool, the blackguard. Poor Orade. Well, he's gone under for a time. For a time? My dear Frank, I tell you he has absolutely ceased to be. Aubrey, who has been writing busily, turns his head towards the speakers and listens. His lips are set, and there is a frown upon his face. For all practical purposes you may regard him as the late George Oread. Tomorrow the very characteristics of his speech, as we remember them, will have become obsolete. But surely, in the course of years, he and his wife will outlive? No, no, Doctor. Don't try to upset one of my settled beliefs. You may dive into many waters, but there is one social dead sea. Perhaps you're right. Right? Good God, I wish you could prove me otherwise. Why, for years I've been sitting and watching and waiting. You're informed tonight, Cayley. May we ask where you've been in the habit of squandering your useful leisure? Where? On the shore of that same sea? And pray, what have you been waiting for? For some of my best friends to come up. Aubrey utters a half-stifled exclamation of impatience. Then he hurriedly gathers up his papers from the writing table. The three men turn to him. Eh? Oh, I... I'll finish my letters in the other room if you'll excuse me for five minutes. Tell Cayley the news. He goes out. Drummle, hurrying to the door. Oh, my dear fellow, my jabbering has disturbed you. I'll never talk again as long as I live. Close the door, Cayley. Drummle shuts the door. Cayley? Drummle, advancing to the dinner table. A smoke, a smoke, or I perish. Selects a cigar from the little cabinet. Cayley, marriages are in the air. Are they? Discover the basilisk, Doctor, and destroy it. I mean among our friends. Oh, Nugent Warrender's engagement to Lady Alice Tring. I've heard of that. They're not to be married till the spring. Another marriage that concerns us a little takes place tomorrow. Whose marriage? Aubrey's. Aub? Looking towards Miss Quith. Is it a joke? No. Drummel, looking from Miss Quith to Jane. To whom? He doesn't tell us. We three were asked here tonight to receive the announcement. Aubrey has some theory that marriage is likely to alienate a man from his friends, and it seems to me that he has taken the precaution to wish us goodbye. No, no. Practically, surely. Drummle, thoughtfully. Marriage in general, does he mean, or this marriage? That's the point, Frank says. No, no, no. I feared it suggested. Well, well. To Drummle. What do you think of it? Drummle, after a slight pause. Is there a light there? Lighting his cigar. He wraps the lady in mystery, you say? Most modestly. Aubrey's not a very young man. Forty-three. Ah, large critique. A dangerous age, yes, yes. When you two fellows go home, do you mind leaving me behind here? Not at all. 
by all means all right anxiously deuce take it the man's second marriage mustn't be another mistake with his head bent he walks up to the fireplace you knew him in his short married life Kayleigh? terribly unsatisfactory wasn't it well looking at the door i quite closed that door yes settles himself on the sofa jane is seated in an armchair drummle smoking with his back to the fire he married a miss harriet that was in the year eighteen confound dates of twenty years ago she was a lovely creature by jove she was by religion a roman catholic she was one of your cold sort you know all marble arms and black velvet i remember with painful distinctness as the only woman who ever made me nervous ha ha he loved her distraction as they say jupiter how fervently that poor devil courted her but i don't believe she allowed him even to squeeze her fingers she was an iceberg but as for kissing the mere contact would have given him chapped lips <laughs> however he married her and took her away the latter greatly to my relief abroad do you mean eh Yes, I imagine he gratified her by renting a via in Lapland, but I don't know. After a while they returned, and then I saw how woefully Aubrey had miscalculated results. Miscalculated? He had reckoned, poor wretch, that in the early days of marriage she would thaw. But she didn't. I used to picture him closing his doors and making up the fire in the hope of seeing her features relax. Bless her. The thaw never set in. I believe she kept a thermometer in her stays and always registered ten degrees below zero. However, in time, a child came. A daughter. Didn't that? Not a bit of it. It made matters worse. Frightened at her failure to stir up in him some sympathetic religious belief, she determined upon strong measures with regard to the child. He opposed her for a miserable year or so, but she wore him down, and the insensible little brat was placed in a convent, first in France, then in Ireland. Not long afterwards the mother died, strangely enough, of fever, the only warmth, I believe, that ever came to that woman's body. Don't, Cayley. The child is living, we know. Yes, if you choose to call it living. Miss Tankery, a young woman of nineteen now, is in the Loretto convent in Arma. She professes to have found her true vocation in a religious life, and within a month or two will take final vows. He ought to have removed his daughter from the convent when the mother died. <sighs> yes, yes. But absolutely at the end there was reconciliation between husband and wife, and she won his promise that the child should complete her conventual education. He reaped his reward. When he attempted to gain his girl's confidence and affection, he was too late. He found he was dealing with the spirit of the mother. You remember his visit to Ireland last month? Yes. That was to wish his girl goodbye. Poor fellow. He sent for me when he came back. I think he must have had a lingering hope that the girl would relent. It would come to life, as it were, at the last moment. For, for an hour or so, in this room, he was terribly shaken. I'm sure he'd clung to that hope from the persistent way in which he kept breaking off in his talk to repeat one dismal word, as if he couldn't realize his position without dinning this damned word into his head. What word was that? Alone. Alone. Aubrey returns. A thousand apologies. Drummle, gaily. We are talking about you, my dear Aubrey. 
During the telling of the story, Misquith has risen and gone to the fire, and Drummle has thrown himself full length on the sofa. Aubrey now joins Misquith and Jane. Well, Cayley, are you surprised? Sir, <laughs> I haven't been surprised for twenty years. And you're not angry with me? Angry? <laughs> Rising. Because you considerately withhold the name of a lady with whom it is now the object of my life to become acquainted. My dear fellow, you pique my curiosity. You give zest to my existence. And as for a wedding, who on earth wants to attend that familiar and probably drafty function? <coughs> ah, my cigar is out. Let's talk about something else. Misquith, looking at his watch. Not tonight, Aubrey. My dear Frank. I go up to Scotland tomorrow, and there are some little matters. I am off to. No, no. I must. I have to give a look to a case in Clifford Street on my way home. Aubrey going to the door. Well. Miss Quith and Jane exchange looks with Drummle. Aubrey opening the door and calling. Morse, hats and coats. I shall write to you all next week from Genoa or Florence. Now, Doctor, Frank, remember my love to Mrs. Misquith and to Mrs. Jane. Morse enters with hats and coats. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And your young people. As Misquith and Jane put on their coats, there is the clatter of careless talk. Kelly, I meet you at dinner on Sunday. At the Stratfields. That's very pleasant. Miss Quith putting on his coat with Aubrey's aid. Ah! What's wrong? A twinge. Why didn't I go to X in August? Jane shaking hands with Drummle. Good night, Kelly. Good night, my dear doctor. Miss Quith shaking hands with Drummle. Cayley, are you in town for long? Dear friend, I'm nowhere for long. Good night. Good night. Aubrey, Jane, and Miss Quith go out, followed by Morse. The hum of talk is continued outside. A cigar, Frank? No, thank you. Going to walk, Doctor? If Frank will. By all means. It's a cold night. The door is closed. Drummle remains standing with his coat on his arm and his hat in his hand. Drummle to himself, thoughtfully. Now then, what the devil? Aubrey returns, eyeing Drummle a little awkwardly. Well, Cayley? Well, Aubrey? Aubrey walks up to the fire and stands looking into it. You're not going, old chap? Drummel, sitting. No. Aubrey, after a slight pause, with a forced laugh. Ha! Ah, Cayley, I never thought I should feel shy with you. Why do you? Never mind. Now, I can quite understand a man wishing to be married in the dark, as it were. You can? In your place, I should very likely adopt the same course. You think so? And if I intended marrying a lady not prominently in society, as I presume you do, as I presume you do... Well? As I presume you do, I'm not sure that I should tender her for preliminary dissection at afternoon tea tables. No? In fact, there's probably only one person, were I in your position tonight, with whom I should care to chat the matter over. Who's that? Yourself, of course. Going to Aubrey and standing beside him. Of course yourself, old friend. Aubrey, after a pause. I must seem a brute to you, Cayley. But there are some acts which are hard to explain, hard to defend. To defend? Some acts which one must trust to time to put right. Drummle watches him for a moment, then takes up his hat and coat. 
Well, I'll be moving. Kaylee, confound you and your old friendship. Do you think I forget it? Put your coat down. Why did you stay behind here? Kaylee, the lady I am going to marry is the lady who is known as Mrs. Jarman. There is a pause. Mrs. Jarman? Are you serious? He walks up to the fireplace, where he leans upon the mantelpiece, uttering something like a groan. As you've got this out of me, I give you leave to say all you care to say. Come, we'll be plain with each other. You know Mrs. Jarman? I first met her at... Well, what does it matter? Yes, yes, everything. Come. I met her at Hamburg two, three seasons ago. Not as Mrs. Jarman? No. She was then... Mrs. Dartrey. Yes. She has also seen you in London, she says. Certainly. In Alford Street. Go on. Please. I insist. Drummle with a slight shrug of the shoulders. Sometime last year I was asked by a man to sup at his house one night after the theatre. Mr. Selwyn Ethurst, a bachelor. Yes. You were surprised, therefore, to find Mr. Ethurst aided in his cursed hospitality by a lady. I was unprepared. The lady you had known as Mrs. Dartrey. Drummle inclines his head silently. There is something of a yachting cruise in the Mediterranean, too, is there not? I joined Peter Jarman's yacht at Marseilles in the spring, a month before he died. Mrs. Jarman was on board? She was a kind hostess. And an old acquaintance? Yes. You have told your story. With your assistance. I have put you to the pain of telling it to show you that this is not the case of a blind man entrapped by an artful woman. Let me add that Mrs. Jarman has no legal right to that name, that she is simply Miss Ray, Miss Paula Ray. Drummle, after a pause. I should like to express my regret, Aubrey, for the way in which I spoke of George Oriot's marriage. You mean you compare Lady Oriot with Miss Ray? Drummle is silent. Oh, of course. To you, Cayley, all women who have been roughly treated, and who dare to survive by borrowing a little of our philosophy, are alike. You see in the crowd of the ill-used only one pattern. You can't detect the shades of goodness, intelligence, even nobility there. Well, how should you? The crowd is dimly lighted. And besides, yours is the way of the world. My dear Aubrey, I live in the world. The name we give our little parish of St. James. Drummle, laying a hand on Aubrey's shoulder. And you are quite prepared, my friend, to forfeit the esteem of your little parish? I avoid mortification by shifting from one parish to another. I give up Pell-Mell for the Surrey Hills. Leave off varnishing my boots, and double the thickness of the soles. And your skin? Do you double the thickness of that also? I know you think me a fool, Cayley. You needn't infer that I'm a coward into the bargain. No, I know what I'm doing, and I do it deliberately, defiantly. I'm alone. I injure no living soul by the step I'm going to take. And so you can't urge the one argument which might restrain me. Of course, I don't expect you to think compassionately, fairly even, of the woman whom I, whom I am drawn to. My dear Aubrey, uh, I assure you I consider Mrs. Miss Jarman, uh, Mrs. Ray, uh, Miss Ray delightful. But I confess there is a form of chivalry which I gravely distrust, especially in a man of our age. Thanks. I've heard you say that from forty till fifty a man is at heart either a stoic or a satyr. Drummle protestingly. Ah, now. I am neither. I have a temperate, honorable affection for Mrs. Jarman. She has never met a man who has treated her well. I intend to treat her well. That's all. 
and in a few years, Cayley, if you've not quite forsaken me, I'll prove to you that it's possible to rear a life of happiness, of good repute, on a miserable foundation. Drummel offering his hand. Do prove it. Aubrey taking his hand. We have spoken too freely of, of Mrs. Jarman. I was excited, angry. Please forget it. My dear Aubrey, when we next meet I shall remember nothing but my respect for the lady who bears your name. Morse enters, closing the door behind him carefully. What is it? Morse hesitatingly. May I speak to you, sir? Mrs. Jarman, sir. Aubrey softly to Morse. Mrs. Jarman? Do you mean she is at the lodge in her carriage? No, sir. Here. Aubrey looks towards Drummle, perplexed. There's a nice fire in your... in that room, sir. Glancing in the direction of the door leading to the bedroom. Aubrey, between his teeth, angrily. Very well. Morris retires. Drummle, looking at his watch. A quarter to eleven. Horrible. Taking up his hat and coat. Must get to bed. Up late every night this week. Aubrey assists Drummel with his coat. Thank you. Well, good night, Aubrey. I feel I've been too serious, quite out of keeping with myself. Pray overlook it. Aubrey, kindly. Ah, Cayley. Drummel, putting on a neck handkerchief. And remember that, after all, I'm merely a spectator in life. Nothing more than a man at a play, in fact. Only, like the old-fashioned playgoer, I love to see certain characters happy and comfortable at the finish. You understand? I think I do. Then, for as long as you can, old friend, will you keep a stall for me? Yes, Cayley. Ha <laughs> ha! Good night. Bustling to the door. Don't bother. I'll let myself out. Good night. God bless you. He goes out. Aubrey follows him. Morris enters by the other door, carrying some unopened letters which, after a little consideration, he places on the mantelpiece against the clock. Aubrey returns. Yes? You hadn't seen your letters that came by the nine o'clock post, sir. I've put them where they'll catch your eye by and by. Thank you. Morris, hesitatingly. Gunter's cook and waiter have gone, sir. Would you prefer me to go to bed? Aubrey, frowning. Certainly not. Very well, sir. He goes out. Aubrey, opening the upper door. Paula! Paula! Paula enters and throws her arms around his neck. She is a young woman of about twenty-seven, beautiful, fresh, innocent-looking, she is in superb evening dress. Dearest. Why have you come here? Angry? Yes. No. But it's eleven o'clock. Paula laughing. I know. What on earth will Morse think? Do you trouble yourself about what servants think? Of course. Goose, they're only machines made to wait upon people and to give evidence in the divorce court. Looking round. Oh, indeed, a snug little dinner. Three men. Paula, suspiciously. Men? Men. Paula, penitently. Ah. Sitting at the table. I'm so hungry. Let me get you some game pie, or some... No, no. Hungry for this. What beautiful fruit. I love fruit when it's expensive. He clears a space on the table places a plate before her, and helps her to fruit. I haven't dined, Aubrey, dear. You poor girl! Why? In the first place, I forgot to order any dinner, and my cook, who has always loathed me, thought he'd pay me out before he departed. The beast! That's precisely what I... No, Paula. What I told my maid to call him. What next will you think of me? Forgive me. You must be starved. Paula eating fruit. I didn't care, 
as there was nothing to eat i sat in my best frock with my toes on the dining-room fender and dreamt oh such a lovely dinner party dear lonely little woman it was perfect i saw you at the end of a very long table opposite me and we exchanged sly glances now and again over the flowers we were host and hostess aubrey and had been married about five years aubrey kissing her hand five years and on each side of us was the nicest set imaginable you know dearest the sort of men and women that can't be imitated yes yes eat some more fruit but i haven't told you the best part of my dream tell me well although we had been married only such a few years i seemed to know by the look on their faces that none of our guests had ever heard anything 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 peculiar about the fascinating hostess that's just how it will be paula the world moves so quickly that's just how it will be paula with a little grimace i wonder glancing at the fire oh do throw another log on aubrey mending the fire there but you mustn't be here long hospitable wretch i've something important to tell you no stay where you are turning from him her face averted look here that was my dream aubrey but the fire went out while i was dozing and i woke up with a regular fit of the shivers and the result of it all was that I ran upstairs and scribbled you a letter. Dear baby. Remain where you are. Taking a letter from her pocket. This is it. I have given you an account of myself, furnished you with a list of my adventures since I, you know. Weighing the letter in her hand. I wonder if it would go for a penny. Most of it you're acquainted with. I've told you a good deal, haven't I? Oh, Paula! What I haven't told you, I dare say you've heard from others, but in case they've omitted anything, the dears, it's all here. In heaven's name, why must you talk like this tonight? It may save discussion by and by, don't you think? Holding out the letter. There you are. No, dear, no. Take it. He takes the letter. Read it through after I've gone, and then read it again, and... Turn the matter over in your mind, finally. And if, even at the very last moment, you feel you oughtn't to go to church with me, send a messenger to Pont Street any time before eleven tomorrow, telling me that you're afraid, and I... I'll take the blow. Why, what, what do you think I am? That's it. It's because I know that you're such a good, dear fellow that I want to save you the chance of ever feeling sorry you married me. I really love you so much, Aubrey, that to save you, that I'd rather you treated me as... as the others have done. Aubrey, turning from her with a cry. Oh! Paula, after a slight pause. I suppose I've shocked you. I can't help it if I have. She sits with assumed languor and indifference. He turns to her, advances, and kneels by her. My dearest, you don't understand me. I... I can't bear to hear you always talking about what's done with. I tell you I'll never remember it. Paula, can't you dismiss it? Try. Darling, if we promise each other to forget, to forget, we're bound to be happy. After all, it's a mechanical matter. The moment a wretched thought enters your head, you quickly think of something bright. It depends on one's will. Shall I burn this, dear? Referring to the letter he holds in his hand. Let me, let me. Paula with a shrug of the shoulders. I don't suppose there's much that's new to you in it, just as you like. He goes to the fire and burns the letter. There's an end of it. Returning to her. What's the matter? Paula, rising, coldly. Oh, nothing. I'll go and put my cloak on. Aubrey, detaining her. What is the matter? Well, I think you might have said, you're very generous, Paula, or at least, thank you, dear, when I offered to set you free. Aubrey, catching her in his arms. Ah! 
ah ah ha ha it's all very well but you don't know what it cost me to make such an offer i do so want to be married but you never imagined perhaps not and yet i did think of what i'd do at the end of our acquaintance if you had preferred to behave like the rest taking a flower from her bodice hush oh i forgot what would you have done when we parted why killed myself paula dear it's true putting the flower in his buttonhole do you know i feel certain i should make away with myself if anything serious happened to me anything serious why has nothing ever been serious to you paula not lately not since a long while ago i made up my mind then to have done with taking things seriously if i hadn't i however we won't talk about that but now now life will be different to you won't it quite different eh dear oh yes now only aubrey mind you keep me always happy i will try to i know i couldn't swallow a second big dose of misery i know that if ever i felt wretched again truly wretched i should take a leaf out of connie tillmont's book you remember they found her <gasps> with a look of horror for god's sake don't let your thoughts run on such things <laughs> how scared you look there think of the time dearest what will my coachman say my cloak she runs off gaily by the upper door aubrey looks after her for a moment then he walks up to the fire and stands warming his feet at the bars as he does so he raises his head and observes the letters upon the mantelpiece he takes one down quickly ah Eline. opening the letter and reading my dear father a great change has come over me i believe my mother in heaven has spoken to me and counseled me to turn to you in your loneliness at any rate your words have reached my heart and i no longer feel fitted for this solemn life i am ready to take my place by you dear father will you receive me Eline. paula re-enters dressed in a handsome cloak he stares at her as if he hardly realized her presence what are you staring at don't you admire my cloak yes couldn't you wait till i'd gone before reading your letters Aubrey, putting the letter away. Uh, I beg your pardon. Take me downstairs to the carriage. Slipping her arm through his. How I tease you. Tomorrow. I'm so happy. They go out. End of the first act. Act two of The Second Mrs. Tanqueray by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Second Act A morning room in Aubrey Tanqueray's house, Hirecombe, near Willowmere, Surrey, a bright and prettily furnished apartment of irregular shape with double doors opening into a small hall at the back, another door on the left, and a large recessed window through which is obtained a view of extensive grounds. Everything about the room is charming and graceful. The fire is burning in the grate, and a small table is tastefully laid for breakfast. It is a morning in early spring, and the sun is streaming in through the window. Aubrey and Paula are seated at breakfast, and Aubrey is silently reading his letters. Two servants, a man and a woman, hand dishes, and then retire. After a little while, Aubrey puts his letters aside and looks across to the window. Sunshine! Spring! Paula, glancing at the clock. Exactly six minutes. Six minutes? Six minutes, Aubrey, dear, since you made your last remark. I beg your pardon. I was reading my letters. Have you seen Aline this morning? Paula, coldly. Your last observation but one was about Aline. Dearest, what shall I talk about? 
Aline breakfasted two hours ago, Morgan tells me, and then went out, walking with her dog. She wraps up warmly, I hope. This sunshine is deceptive. I ran about the lawn last night, after dinner, in satin shoes. Were you anxious about me? Certainly. Paula, melting. Really? You make me wretchedly anxious. You delight in doing incautious things. You are incurable. Oh, what a beast I am. Going to him and kissing him, then glancing at the letters by his side. A letter from Cayley. He is staying very near here, with Mrs. Very near here. With the lady whose chimneys we have the honour of contemplating from our window. With Mrs. Cortelion, yes. Mrs. Cortelion, the woman who might have set the example of calling on me when we first threw out roots in this deadly lively soil. Deuce take Mrs. Cortelion. Hush, my dear girl. Paula, returning to her seat. Oh, I know she's an old acquaintance of yours, and of the first Mrs. Tanqueray, and she joins the rest of them in slapping the second Mrs. Tanqueray in the face. However, I have my revenge. She's six and forty, and I wish nothing worse to happen to any woman. Well, she's going to town, Cayley says here, and his visit's at an end. He's coming over this morning to call on you. Shall we ask him to transfer himself to us? Do say yes. Yes. Aubrey, gladly. Ah, ha! Old Cayley. Paula, coldly. He'll amuse you. And you too. Because you find a companion, shall I be boisterously hilarious? Come, come. He talks London, and you know you like that. London, London or heaven, which is further from me? Paula! Oh, oh, I'm so bored, Aubrey. Aubrey, gathering up his letters and going to her, leaning over her shoulder. Baby, what can I do for you? I suppose nothing. You have done all you can for me. What do you mean? You have married me. He walks away from her, thoughtfully, to the writing table. As he places his letters on the table, he sees an addressed letter, stamped for the post, lying on the blotting book. He picks it up. Aubrey, in an altered tone. You've been writing this morning before breakfast? Paula, looking at him quickly, then away again. Ah, uh, that letter. Aubrey, with the letter in his hand. To Lady Oriad. Why? Why not? Mabel's an old friend of mine. Are you corresponding? I heard from her yesterday. They've just returned from the Riviera. She seems happy. Aubrey, sarcastically. That's good news. Why are you always so cutting about Mabel? She's a kind-hearted girl. Everything's altered. She even thinks of letting her hair go back to brown. She's Lady Oraid. She's married to George. What's the matter with her? Aubrey, turning away. Oh! You drive me mad sometimes with the tone you take about things. Great goodness, if you come to that, George Oraid's wife isn't a bit worse than yours. He faces her suddenly. I suppose I needn't have made that observation. No, there was scarcely a necessity. He throws the letter onto the table and takes up the newspaper. I am very sorry. All right, dear. Paula, trifling with the letter. I... I'd better tell you what I've written. I, I meant to do so, of course. I... I've asked the Oraids to come and stay with us. He looks at her and lets the paper fall to the ground in a helpless way. George was a great friend of Cayley's. I'm sure he would be delighted to meet them here. <laughs> they say Oriad has taken to tippling at dinner. Heavens above! Oh, I've no patience with you. You'll kill me with this life. She selects some flowers from a vase on the table, cuts and arranges them, and fastens them in her bodice. What is my existence, Sunday to Saturday? In the morning a drive down to the village with the groom, to give my orders to the tradespeople? At lunch, you and Aline? In the afternoon, a novel. The newspapers, if fine, another drive. If fine. Tea, you and Aline. Then two hours of dusk. Then dinner, you and Aline. Then a game of Bessike, you and I, while Aline reads a religious book in a dull corner. 
then a yawn from me, another from you, a sigh from Eileen, three figures suddenly rise. Good night, good night, good night. Mwah. God bless you. Ugh. Yes, yes, Paula. Yes, dearest. That's what it is now. But by and by, if people begin to come round us... Ha! Huh. That's where we've made the mistake, my friend Aubrey. Pointing to the window. Do you believe these people will ever come round us? Your former crony, Mrs. Cortelion? Or the grim old vicar, or that wife of his whose huge nose is positively indecent? Or the Ullathorns, or the Gollans, or Lady William Petras? I know better. When the young ones gradually take the place of the old, there will still remain the sacred tradition that the dreadful person who lives at the top of the hill is never, under any circumstances, to be called upon. And so we shall go on here, year in, year out, until the sap is run out of our lives, and we're stale and dry and withered from sheer solitary respectability. Upon my word, I wondered that we didn't see that we should have been far happier if we'd gone in for the devil-may-care, cafe-living sort of life in town. After all, I have a set, and you might have joined it. It's true I did want, dearly, dearly, to be a married woman. But where's the pride in being a married woman among married women who are married? If... Seeing that Aubrey's head has sunk into his hands. Aubrey, my dear boy... You're not crying. He looks up with a flushed face. Aline enters, dressed very simply for walking. She is a low-voiced, grave girl of about nineteen, with a face somewhat resembling a Madonna. Towards Paula, her manner is cold and distant. Aubrey, in an undertone. Aline. Good morning, Papa. Good morning, Paula. Paula puts her arms around Aline and kisses her. Aline makes little response. Good morning. We've been breakfasting this side of the house to get the sun. She sits at the piano and rattles at a gay melody. Seeing that Paula's back is turned to them, Aline goes to Aubrey and kisses him. He returns the kiss almost furtively. As they separate, the servants re-enter and proceed to carry out the breakfast table. Aubrey to Aline. I guess where you've been. There's some gorse clinging to your frock. Aline, removing a sprig of gorse from her skirt. Rover and I walked nearly as far as Blackmoor. The poor fellow has a thorn in his pad. I'm going upstairs for my tweezers. Aline. She returns to him. Paula is a little depressed, out of sorts. She complains that she has no companion. I am with Paula nearly all the day, Papa. Ah, but you're such a little mouse. Paula likes cheerful people about her. I'm afraid I'm naturally rather silent, and it's so difficult to seem to be what one is not. I don't wish that, Aline. I will offer to go down to the village with Paula this morning. Shall I? Aubrey, touching her hand gently. Thank you. Do. When I've looked after Rover, I'll come back to her. She goes out. Paula ceases playing and turns on the music stool, looking at Aubrey. Well, have you and Aline had your little confidence? Confidence? Do you think I couldn't feel it, like a pain between my shoulders? Aline is coming back in a few minutes to be with you. Bending over her. Paula, Paula dear, is this how you keep your promise? Oh. Rising impatiently and crossing swiftly to the settee where she sits, moving restlessly. I can't keep my promise. I am jealous. It won't be smothered. I see you looking at her, watching her. Your voice drops when you speak to her. I know how fond you are of that girl, Aubrey. What would you have? I've no other home for her. She is my daughter. She's your saint, Saint Aline. You have often told me how good and sweet you think her. Good, yes. Do you imagine that makes me less jealous? Going to him and clinging to his arm. Aubrey, there are two sorts of affection. The love for a woman you respect and the love for a woman you love. She gets the first from you. I never can. Hush, hush, you don't realize what you say. If Aline cared for me only a little, it would be different. I shouldn't be jealous then. 
Why doesn't she care for me? She, she, she will in time. You can't say that without stuttering. Her disposition seems a little unresponsive. She resembles her mother in many ways. I can see it every day. She's marble. It's a shame. There's not the slightest excuse. For all she knows, I'm as much a saint as she, only married. Dearest, help me to win her over. Help you? You can. Teach her that it is her duty to love me. She hangs on every word you speak. I'm sure, Aubrey, that the love of a nice woman who believed me to be like herself would do me the world of good. You'd get the benefit of it as well as I. It would soothe me. It would make me less horribly restless. It would take this, this mischievous feeling from me. Coaxingly. Aubrey. Have patience. Everything will come right. Yes, if you help me. In the meantime, you will tear up your letter to Lady Oread, won't you? Paula, kissing his hand. Of course I will. Anything. Ah, thank you, dearest. Oh, my good gracious! <laughs> Just imagine St. Helene and that woman side by side. Paula going back with a cry. Ah! Oh, what? It's Helene you are considering, not me. It's all Helene with you. Helene, Helene! Helene re-enters. Did you call me, Paula? Clenching his hands, Aubrey turns away and goes out. Is Papa angry? I drive him distracted sometimes. There, I confess it. Do you? Oh, why do you? Because I... because I'm jealous. Jealous? Yes, of you. Aline is silent. Well, what do you think of that? I knew it. I've seen it. It hurts me dreadfully. What do you wish me to do? Go away? Leave us? Beckoning her with a motion of the head. Look here. Aline goes to Paula slowly and unresponsively. You could cure me of my jealousy very easily. Why don't you like me? What do you mean by like you? I don't understand. Love me. Love is not a feeling that is under one's control. I shall alter as time goes on, perhaps. I didn't begin to love my father deeply till a few months ago, and then I obeyed my mother. Ah, yes. You dream things, don't you? See them in your sleep? You fancy your mother speaks to you? When you have lost your mother, it is a comfort to believe that she is dead only to this life, that she still watches over her child. I do believe that of my mother. Well, and so you haven't been bidden to love me? Aline, after a pause, almost inaudibly. No. Dreams are only a hash-up of one's day thoughts, I suppose you know. Think intently of anything, and it's bound to come back to you at night. I don't cultivate dreams myself. Oh, I knew you would only sneer. I'm not sneering, I'm speaking the truth. I say that if you cared for me in the daytime, I should soon make friends with those nightmares of yours. Aline, why don't you try to look on me as your second mother? Of course, there are not many years between us, but... I'm ever so much older than you, in experience. I shall have no children of my own, I know that. It would be a real comfort to me if you would make me feel we belong to each other. Won't you? Perhaps you think I'm odd, not nice. Well, the fact is I've two sides to my nature, and I've let the one almost smother the other. A few years ago I went through some trouble, and since then I haven't shed a tear. I believe... If you put your arms around me, just once, I should run upstairs and have a good cry. There, I've talked to you as I've never talked to a woman in my life. Aline, you seem to fear me. Don't. Kiss me. With a cry, almost of despair, Aline turns from Paula and sinks onto the settee, covering her face with her hands. Oh, why is it? How dare you treat me like this? And what do you mean by it? What do you mean? A servant enters. Mr. Drumley, ma'am. Kaylee Drummle, in riding dress, enters briskly. The servant retires. Paula, recovering herself. Well, Kaylee. Drummle, shaking hands with her cordially. How are you? 
shaking hands with Aline, who rises. I saw you in the distance an hour ago, in the gorse near Stapleton's. I didn't see you, Mr. Drummle. My dear Aline, it is my experience that no charming young lady of nineteen ever does see a man of forty-five. <laughs> Aline going to the door. Paula, Papa wishes me to drive down to the village with you this morning. Do you care to take me? Paula, coldly. Oh, by all means. Pray tell Watts to balance the cart for three. Aline goes out. How's Aubrey? Very well, when Aline's about the house. And you? I needn't ask. Paula, walking away to the window. Oh, a dog's life, my dear Cayley, mine. Eh? Doesn't that define a happy marriage? I'm sleek, well-kept, well-fed, never without a bone to gnaw and fresh straw to lie upon. Gazing out of the window. Oh, dear me. Hmm. Well, I heartily congratulate you on your kennel. The view from the terrace here is superb. Yes, I can see London. London? Not quite so far, surely. I can. Also the Mediterranean on a fine day. I wonder what Algiers looks like this morning from the sea. Impulsively. Oh, Cayley, do you remember those jolly times on board Peter Jarman's yacht when we lay off? Stopping suddenly, seeing Drummle staring at her. Good gracious, what are we talking about? Aubrey enters. Aubrey to Drummle. Dear old chap, has Paula asked you? Not yet. We want you to come to us, now that you're leaving Mrs. Cordelion, at once, today. Stay a month, as long as you please. Eh, Paula? As long as you can possibly endure it. Do, Cayley. Drummle, looking at Aubrey. Delighted. To Paula. Charming of you to have me. My dear man, you're a blessing. I must telegraph to London for more fish. A strange appetite to cater for. Something to do, to do, to do. She goes out in a mood of almost childish delight. Drummel eyeing Aubrey. Well? Aubrey, with a wearied, anxious look. Well, Cayley? How are you getting on? My position doesn't grow less difficult. I told you, when I met you last week, of this feverish, jealous attachment of Paula's for Aline. Yes. I hardly know why. But I came to the conclusion that you don't consider it an altogether fortunate attachment. Aline doesn't respond to it. These are early days. Aline will warm towards your wife by and by. Ah, but there's the question, Cayley. What question? The question which positively distracts me. Aline is so different from most women. I don't believe a purer creature exists out of heaven. And I, I asked myself, am I doing right in exposing her to the influence of poor Paula's light, careless nature? My dear Aubrey. That shocks you? So it does me. I assure you, I long to urge my girl to break down the reserve which keeps her apart from Paula. But somehow I can't do it. Well, I don't do it. How can I make you understand? But when you come to us, you'll understand quickly enough. Cayley, there's hardly a subject you can broach on which poor Paula hasn't some strange, out-of-the-way thought to give utterance to, some curious, warped notion. They are not mere worldly thoughts. Unless, good God, they belong to the little hellish world which our black guardian has created. No, her ideas have too little calculation in them to be called worldly. But it makes it the more dreadful that such thoughts should be ready, spontaneous. That expressing them has become a perfectly natural process. That her words, acts even, have almost lost their proper significance for her, and seem beyond her control. Ah... Uh, and the pain of listening to it all from the woman one loves, the woman one hoped to make happy and contented, who was really and truly a good woman, as it were, maimed. Well, this is my burden, and I shouldn't speak to you of it but for my anxiety about Aline. Aline, 
what is to be her future it is in my hands what am i to do Kaylee, when i remember how aline comes to me from another world i always think when i realize the charge that's laid on me i find myself wishing in a sort of terror that my child were safe under the ground my dear aubrey aren't you making a mistake very likely what is it a mistake not in regarding your aline as an angel but in believing that under any circumstances it would be possible for her to go through life without getting her white robe um, shall we say a little dusty at the hem don't take me for a cynic i'm sure there are many women upon earth who are almost divinely innocent but being on earth they must send their robes to the laundry occasionally ah and it's right that they should have to do so for what can they learn from the checking of their little washing bills but lessons of charity now i see but two courses open to you for the disposal of your angel yes you must either restrict her to a paradise which is like every earthly paradise necessarily somewhat imperfect or treat her as an ordinary flesh and blood young woman and give her the advantages of that society to which she properly belongs advantages my dear aubrey of all forms of innocence mere ignorance is the least admirable take my advice let her walk and talk and suffer and be healed with the great crowd do it and hope that she'll some day meet a good honest fellow who will make her life complete happy secure now you see what i'm driving at a sanguine program my dear Cayley. oh i'm not pooh-poohing it putting sentiment aside of course i know that a fortunate marriage for Aline would be the best perhaps the only solution of my difficulty but you forget the danger of the course you suggest danger if Aline goes among men and women how can she escape from learning sooner or later the history of poor paula's old life hmm you remember the episode of the jeweler's son in the arabian nights <laughs> of course you don't well if your daughter lives she can't escape what you're afraid of aubrey gives a half stifled exclamation of pain and when she does hear the story surely it would be better that she should have some knowledge of the world to help her to understand it to understand to understand to to uh, philosophize to philosophize philosophy is toleration and it is only one step from toleration to forgiveness you're right Cayley. i believe you always are yes yes but even if I had the courage to attempt to solve the problem of Aline's future in this way, I... I'm helpless. How? What means have I now of placing my daughter in the world I've left? Oh, some friend. Some woman friend. I have none. They're gone. You're wrong there. I know one. Aubrey, listening. That's Paula's cart. Let's discuss this again. Drummle going up to the window and looking out. It isn't the dog cart. Turning to Aubrey. I hope you'll forgive me, old chap. What for? Whose wheels do you think have been cutting ruts in your immaculate drive? A servant enters. Mrs. Cortelion, sir. Mrs. Cortelion? Very well. The servant withdraws. What on earth is the meaning of this? <clears throat> While I've been our old friend's guest, Aubrey, we have very naturally talked a good deal about you and yours. Indeed, have you? Yes. And Alice Cordelion has arrived at the conclusion that it would have been far kinder had she called on Mrs. Tankery long ago. She's going abroad for Easter before settling down in London for the season, and I believe she has come over this morning to ask for Aline's companionship. Oh, I see. Frowning. Quite a friendly little conspiracy, my dear Cayley. Conspiracy? <laughs> Not at all, I assure you. 
Aline enters from the hall with Mrs. Cortellian, a handsome, good-humoured, spirited woman of about forty-five. Papa! Mrs. Cortellian to Aubrey, shaking hands with him heartily. Well, Aubrey, how are you? I've just been telling this great girl of yours that I knew her when she was a sad-faced, pale baby. How is Mrs. Tanqueray? I have been a bad neighbour, and I'm here to beg forgiveness. Is she indoors? She's upstairs putting on a hat, I believe. Mrs. Cortellian, sitting comfortably. <sighs> she looks round. Drummle and Aline are talking together in the hall. We used to be very frank with each other, Aubrey. I suppose the old footing is no longer possible, eh? If so, I'm not entirely to blame, Mrs. Cortellion. Mrs. Cortellion? Hmm. No, I admit it. But you must make some little allowance for me, Mr. Tanqueray. Your first wife and I, as girls, were like two cherries on one stalk and then i was the confidential friend of your married life that post perhaps wasn't altogether a sinecure and now well when a woman gets to my age i suppose she's a stupid prejudiced conventional creature however i've got over it and giving him her hand i hope you'll be enormously happy and let me be a friend once more thank you alice that's right. I feel more cheerful than I've done for weeks. But I suppose it would serve me right if the second Mrs. Tanqueray showed me the door. Do you think she will? Aubrey, listening. Here is my wife. Mrs. Cortellian rises, and Paula enters, dressed for driving. She stops abruptly on seeing Mrs. Cortellian. Paula, dear, Mrs. Cortellian has called to see you. Paula starts, looks at Mrs. Cortellian irresolutely, then, after a slight pause, barely touches Mrs. Cortellian's extended hand. Paula, whose manner now alternates between deliberate insolence and assumed sweetness, Mrs. What name, Aubrey? Mrs. Cortellian. Cortellian? Oh, yes, Cortellian. Mrs. Cortellian carefully guarding herself throughout against any expression of resentment. Aubrey ought to have told you that Alice Cortellion and he are very old friends. Oh, very likely he has mentioned the circumstance. I have quite a wretched memory. You know we are neighbours, Mrs. Tanqueray. Neighbours? Are we really? Won't you sit down? They both sit. Neighbours, that's most interesting. Very near neighbours. You can see my roof from your window. I fancy I have observed a roof. But you have been away from home. You have only just returned. I? What makes you think that? Why, because it is two months since we came to Hyakum, and I don't remember your having called. Your memory is now terribly accurate. No, I've not been away from home, and it is to explain my neglect that I am here, rather unceremoniously, this morning. Oh, to explain, quite so. With mock solicitude. Ah, you've been very ill. I ought to have seen that before. Ill? You look dreadfully pulled down. We poor women show illness so plainly in our faces, don't we? Aubrey, anxiously. Paula, dear, Mrs. Cortellion is the picture of health. Mrs. Cortellion, with some asperity. I have never felt better in my life. Paula, looking round innocently. Have I said anything awkward, Aubrey? Tell Mrs. Cortellion how stupid and thoughtless I always am. Mrs. Cortellion, to Drummle, who is now standing close to her. <sighs> Really, Cayley. He soothes her with a nod and smile and a motion of his finger to his lip. Mrs. Tanqueray, I am afraid my explanation will not be quite so satisfactory as either of those you have just helped me to. You may have heard... 
but if you have heard you have doubtless forgotten that twenty years ago when your husband first lived here i was a constant visitor at higher coombe twenty years ago fancy i was a naughty little child then possibly well at that time and till the end of her life my affections were centred upon the lady of this house were they that was very sweet of you aline approaches mrs cortelyon listening intently to her i will say no more on that score but i must add this when two months ago you came here i realized perhaps for the first time that i was a middle-aged woman and that it had become impossible for me to accept without some effort a breaking in upon many tender associations there mrs tanqueray that is my confession will you try to understand it and pardon me paula watching aline sneeringly aline dear you appear to be very interested in mrs cortelyon's reminiscences i don't think i can do better than make you my mouthpiece there is such sympathy between us what do you say can we bring ourselves to forgive mrs cortelyon for neglecting us for two weary months mrs cortelyon to aline pleasantly well aline with a little cry of tenderness aline impulsively sits beside mrs cortelyon and takes her hand oh, my dear child paula in an undertone to aubrey aline isn't so very slow in taking to mrs cortelyon mrs cortelyon to paula and aubrey come this encourages me to broach my scheme mrs Tankery it strikes me that you two good people are just now excellent company for each other while aline would perhaps be glad of a little peep into the world you are anxious to avoid now i am going to paris to-morrow for a week or two before settling down in chester square so don't gasp both of you if this girl is willing and you have made no other arrangements for her will you let her come with me to paris and afterwards remain with me in town during the season aline utters an exclamation of surprise paula is silent what do you say paula paula dear hesitatingly my dear mrs cordelion this is wonderfully kind of you i am really at a loss to eh hey, Drummle watching Paula apprehensively. Kind? Now I must say I don't think so. I begged Alice to take me to Paris, and she declined. I am thrown over for Eline. Ha ha ha! What nonsense you talk, Kaylee! <laughs> the laughter dies out. Paula remains quite still. Paula, dear? Paula slowly collecting herself. One moment. I... I don't quite... To Mrs. Cortelyon. You propose that Eileen leaves Hyacomb almost at once and remains with you some months? It would be a mercy to me. You can afford to be generous to a desolate old widow. Come, Mrs. Tanqueray, won't you spare her? Won't I spare her? Suspiciously. Have you mentioned your plan to Aubrey before I came in? No, I had no opportunity. Nor to Aline? Oh, no. Paula looking about her in suppressed excitement. This hasn't been discussed at all? Behind my back? My dear Mrs. Tanqueray. Aline, let us hear your voice in the matter. I should like to go with Mrs. Cortelyon. Ah. Oh. That is, if, 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 if what? Aline, looking towards Aubrey, appealingly. Papa! Paula, in a hard voice. Oh, of course, I forgot. To Aubrey. My dear Aubrey, it rests with you, naturally, whether I am to lose Aline. Lose Aline? Advancing to Paula. There is no question of losing Aline. 
you would see Aline in town constantly when she returned from Paris. Isn't that so, Mrs. Cordelion? Certainly. <laughs> oh, I didn't know I should be allowed that privilege. Privilege, my dear Mrs. Tankery. Ha ha, that makes all the difference, doesn't it? Aubrey, with assumed gaiety. All the difference? I should think so. To Aline, laying his hand upon her head, tenderly. And you are quite certain you wish to see what the world is like on the other side of Blackmoor? If you are willing, Papa, I am quite certain. Aubrey, looking at Paula irresolutely, then speaking with an effort. Then I... I am willing. Paula, rising and striking the table lightly with her clenched hand. That decides it. There is a general movement, excitedly to Mrs. Cortellian, who advances towards her. When do you want her? We go to town this afternoon at five o'clock and sleep tonight at Bailey's. There is barely time for her to make her preparations. I will undertake that she is ready. I've a great deal to scramble through at home, too, as you may guess. Goodbye. Paula, turning away. Mrs. Cortelion is going. Paula stands looking out of the window, with her back to those in the room. Mrs. Cortelion to Drummle. Cayley. Eh? I've gone through it for the sake of Aubrey and his child, but I... I feel a hundred. Is that a mad woman? Of course. All jealous women are mad. He goes out with Aubrey. Mrs. Cortellian, hesitatingly to Paula. Goodbye, Mrs. Tanqueray. Paula inclines her head with the slightest possible movement, then resumes her former position. Aline comes from the hall and takes Mrs. Cortellian out of the room. After a brief silence, Paula turns with a fierce cry and hurriedly takes off her coat and hat and tosses them upon the settee. Ah! Oh, ah! Oh, ah! Oh. She drops into the chair as Aubrey returns. He stands looking at her. Who's that? I. You have altered your mind about going out? Yes. Please to ring the bell. Aubrey, touching the bell. You are angry about Mrs. Cordelion and Aline. Let me try to explain my reasons. Be careful what you say to me just now. I have never felt like this, except once in my life. Be careful what you say to me. A servant enters. Paula, rising. Is Watts at the door with the cart? Yes, ma'am. Tell him to drive down to the post office directly, with this picking up the letter which has been lying upon the table. With that? Yes, my letter to Lady Orade. Giving the letter to the servant who goes out. Surely you don't wish me to countermand any order of yours to a servant. Call the man back. Take the letter from him. I have not the slightest intention of doing so. I must, then. Going to the door. She snatches up her hat and coat and follows him. What are you going to do? If you stop that letter, I walk out of the house. He hesitates, then leaves the door. I am right in believing that to be the letter inviting George Oriad and his wife to stay here, am I not? Oh, yes, quite right. Let it go. I'll write to him by and by. Paula, facing him. You dare. Hush, Paula. Insult me again, and upon my word, I'll go straight out of the house. Insult you? Insult me! What else is it? My God, what else is it? What do you mean by taking Eileen from me? Listen! Listen to me! And how do you take her? You pack her off in the care of a woman who has deliberately held aloof from me, who's thrown mud at me. Yet this Cordelion creature has only to put foot here once to be entrusted with the charge of a girl you know I dearly want to keep near me. Paula, dear, hear me. Ah, oh, of course, of course. I can't be so useful to your daughter as such people as this, so I'm to be given the go-by for any town friend of yours who turns up and chooses to patronise us. Ha, huh. 
Very well. At any rate, you take Aline from me. You justify my looking for companions where I can most readily find them. You wish me to fully appreciate your reason for sending that letter to Lady Oriad? Precisely. I do. And could you, after all, go back to associates of that order? It's not possible. Paula, mockingly. What? Not after the refining influence of these intensely respectable surroundings? Going to the door. We'll see. Paula! We'll see! She goes out. He stands still, looking after her. End of the second act. Act Three of The Second Mrs. Tanqueray by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Third Act The Drawing Room at Hyacomb. Facing the spectator are two large French windows, sheltered by a veranda leading into the garden. On the right is a door opening into a small hall. The fireplace, with a large mirror above it, is on the left-hand side of the room, and higher up in the same wall are double doors recessed. The room is richly furnished, and everything betokens taste and luxury. The windows are open, and there is moonlight in the garden. Lady Oriet a pretty, affected doll of a woman with a mincing voice and flaxen hair, is sitting on the ottoman, her head resting against the drum and her eyes closed. Paula, looking pale, worn, and thoroughly unhappy, is sitting at a table. Both are in sumptuous dinner gowns. Lady Oriet, opening her eyes. Well, I never. I dropped off feeling her hair. Just fancy. Where are the men? Paula, icily. Outside, smoking. A servant enters with coffee, which he hands to Lady Oriad. Sir George Oriad comes in by the window. He is a man of about thirty-five, with a low forehead, a receding chin, a vacuous expression, and an ominous redness about the nose. Lady Oriad, taking coffee. Here's Dodo. I say, the flies under the veranda make you swear. The servant hands coffee to Paula, who declines it, then to Sir George, who takes a cup. Aye, wait a bit. He looks at the tray searchingly, then puts back his cup. Never mind. Quietly to Lady Oriad. I say, they're do sparing with their liquor, ain't they? The servant goes out at window. Paula to Sir George. Won't you take coffee, George? No thanks. It's getting near time for a whiskey and potash. Approaching Paula, regarding Lady Oriad admiringly. I say. Birdie looks ripping tonight, don't she? Your wife? Yes, Birdie. Ripping? Yes. Quite, quite ripping. He moves round to the settee. Paula watches him with distaste, then rises and walks away. Sir George falls asleep on the settee. Paula, love. I fancied you and Aubrey were a little more friendly at dinner. You haven't made it up, have you? We? Oh, no. We speak before others, that's all. And how long do you intend to carry on this game, dear? Paula, turning away impatiently. I really can't tell you. Sit down, old girl. Don't be so fidgety. Paula sits on the upper seat of the ottoman with her back to Lady Oriet. Of course, it's my duty as an old friend to give you a good talking to. Paula glares at her suddenly and fiercely. But really, I've found one gets so many smacks in the face through interfering in matrimonial squabbles that I've determined to drop it. I think you're wise. 
However, I must say that I do wish you'd look at marriage in a more solemn light. Just as I do, in fact. It is such a beautiful thing, marriage. And if people in our position don't respect it, and set a good example by living happily with their husbands, what can you expect from the middle classes? When did this sad state of affairs between you and Aubrey actually begin? Actually, a fortnight and three days ago. I haven't calculated the minutes. A day or two before Dodo and I turned up. Arrived. Yes. One always remembers one thing by another. We left off speaking to each other the morning I wrote, asking you to visit us. Lucky for you I was able to pop down, wasn't it, dear? Paula, glaring at her again. Most fortunate. A serious split with your husband without a pal on the premises. I should say without a friend in the house would be most unpleasant. Paula, turning to her abruptly. This place must be horribly doleful for you and George just now. At least, you ought to consider him before me. Why don't you leave me to my difficulties? Oh, we're quite comfortable, dear. Thank you, both of us. George and me are so wrapped up in each other, it doesn't matter where we are. I don't want to crow over you, old girl, but I've got a perfect husband. Sir George is now fast asleep, his head thrown back and his mouth open, looking hideous. Paula, glancing at Sir George. So you've given me to understand. Not that we don't have our little differences. Why, we fell out only this very morning. You remember the diamond and ruby tiara Charlie Prestwick gave poor dear Connie Telemont years ago, don't you? No, I do not. No? Well, it's in the market. Benjamin of Piccadilly has got it in his shop window, and I've set my heart on it. You consider it quite necessary? Yes, because what I say to Dodo is this. A lady of my station must smother herself with hair ornaments. It's different with you, love. People don't look for so much blaze from you. But I've got rank to keep up, haven't I? Yes. Well, that was the cause of the little set-to between I and Dodo this morning. He broke two chairs he was in such a rage. I forgot, they're your chairs. Do you mind? No. You know, poor Dodo can't lose his temper without smashing something. If it isn't a chair, it's a mirror. If it isn't that, it's China. A bit of Dresden for choice. Dear old pet. He loves a bit of Dresden when he's furious. He doesn't really throw things at me, dear. He simply lifts them up and drops them. Like a gentleman. I expect our room upstairs will look rather wrecky before I get that tiara. Excuse the suggestion. Perhaps your husband can't afford it. Oh, how dreadfully changed you are, Paula. Dodo can always mortgage something or borrow off his ma. What is coming to you? Ah. <sighs> she sits at the piano and touches the keys. Oh, yes, do play. That's the one thing I envy you for. What shall I play? What was that heavenly piece you gave us last night, dear? A bit of Schubert. Would you like to hear it again? You don't know any comic songs, do you? I'm afraid not. I leave it to you, then. Paula plays. Aubrey and Kaylee Drummle appear outside the window. They look into the room. Aubrey to Drummle. You can see her face in that mirror. Poor girl, how ill and wretched she looks. When are the Oriates going? Heaven knows. Entering the room. But you're entertaining them. What's it to do with heaven? Following Aubrey. Do you know, Kaylee, that even the Oriates serve a useful purpose? My wife actually speaks to me before our guests. Think of that. I've come to rejoice at the presence of the Oriads. I dare say. We're taught that beetles are sent for a benign end. Kaylee, talk to Paula again tonight. Certainly, if I get the chance. 
Let's contrive it. George is asleep. Perhaps I can get that doll out of the way. As they advance into the room, Paula abruptly ceases playing and finds interest in a volume of music. Sir George is now nodding and snoring apoplectically. Lady Oread, whenever you feel inclined for a game of billiards, I'm at your service. Lady Oread, jumping up. Charmed, I'm sure. I really thought you'd forgotten poor little me. Oh, look at Dodo. No, no, don't wake him. He's tired. I must. He looks so plain. Rousing Sir George. Dodo. Dodo. Hello? Dodo, dear, you were snoring. Oh, I say, you could have told me that by and by. You want a cigar, George? Come into the billiard room. Giving his arm to Lady Oriet. Kaylee, bring Paula. Aubrey and Lady Oriet go out. Sir George, rising. Hey, what? Billiard room. Looking at his watch. How goes the... Oh. Hello, hello. Whiskey and potash. He goes rapidly after Aubrey and Lady Oriet. Paula resumes playing. Paula, after a pause. Don't moon about after me, Kaylee. Follow the others. Thanks, by and by. Sitting. That's pretty. Paula, after another pause, still playing. I wish you wouldn't stare so. Was I staring? I'm sorry. She plays a little longer, then stops suddenly, rises and goes to the window, where she stands looking out. Drummle moves from the ottoman to the city. A lovely night. Paula, startled. Oh. Without turning to him. Why do you hop about like a monkey? Heart rooms play the deuce with the nerves. Now, it would have done you good to have walked in the garden with us after dinner and made merry. Why didn't you? You know why. Ah, you're thinking of the difference between you and Aubrey. Yes, I am thinking of it. Well, so am I. How long? Getting on for three weeks. Bless me. It must be. And this would have been such a night to have healed it. Moonlight, the stars, the scent of flowers, and yet enough darkness to enable a kind woman to rest her hand for an instant on the arm of a good fellow who loves her. Ah, ha. it's a wonderful power, dear Mrs. Aubrey, the power of an offended woman. Only realize it. Just that one touch, the mere tips of her fingers, and, for herself and another, she changes the color of the whole world. Paula turning to him calmly. Kaylee, my dear man, you talk exactly like a very romantic old lady. She leaves the window and sits playing with the knickknacks on the table. Drummle to himself. <sighs> that hasn't done it. Well, <laughs> I accept the suggestion. An old woman, eh? Oh, I didn't intend. But why not? I have every qualification. Well, almost. And I confess it would have given this withered bosom a throb of grandmotherly satisfaction if I could have seen you and Aubrey at peace before I take my leave tomorrow. Tomorrow, Kaylee? I must. Oh, this house is becoming unendurable. You're very kind. But you've got the Oreads. Paula, fiercely. The Oreads? I hate the Oreads. I lie awake at night, hating them. Pardon me. I've understood that their visit is, in some degree, owing to... <clears throat> your suggestion. Heavens! That doesn't make me like them better. Somehow or another, I... I've outgrown these people. This woman... I used to think her jolly. Sickens me. I can't breathe when she's near me. The whiff of her handkerchief turns me faint. And she patronizes me by the hour, until I... 
I feel my nails growing longer with every word she speaks. My dear lady, why on earth don't you say all this to Aubrey? Oh, I've been such an utter fool, Cayley. Drummle soothingly. Well, well, mention it to Aubrey. No, no, you don't understand. What do you think I've done? Done? What? Since you invite the Oriots? Yes, I must tell you. Perhaps you'd better not. Look here. I've intercepted some letters from Mrs. Cortelion and Aline to him. Producing three unopened letters from the bodice of her dress. There are the accursed things. From Paris. Two from the Cotillion woman, the other from Aline. But why? Why? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do. I saw letters coming from Aline to her father. Not a line to me, not a line. And one morning it happened I was downstairs before he was, and I spied this one lying with his heap on the breakfast table, and I slipped it into my pocket. Out of malice, Cayley, pure devilry. And a day or two afterwards I met Yules, the postman at the lodge, and took the letters from him, and found these others amongst them. I felt simply fiendish when I saw them. Fiendish! Returning the letters to her bodice. And now I carry them about with me, and they're scorching me like a mustard plaster. Oh, this accounts for Aubrey not hearing from Paris lately. That's an ingenious conclusion to arrive at. Of course it does. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> Paula turning upon him. I suppose it is amusing. I beg pardon. Heaven knows I've little enough to brag about. I'm a bad lot. But not in mean tricks of this sort. In all my life, this is the most caddish thing I've done. How am I to get rid of these letters? That's what I want to know. How am I to get rid of them? If I were you, I should take Aubrey aside and put them into his hands as soon as possible. What? And tell him to his face that I... No, thank you. I suppose you wouldn't like to... No, no. I won't touch them. And you call yourself my friend? Drummle good-humouredly. No, I don't. Perhaps I'll tie them together and give them to his man in the morning. That won't avoid an explanation. Paula, recklessly. Oh, then he must miss them. And trace them. Paula, throwing herself upon the ottoman. I don't care. I know you don't. But let me send him to you now, may I? Now? What do you think a woman's made of? I couldn't stand it, Cayley. I haven't slept for nights. And last night there was thunder, too. I believe I've got the horrors. Drummel, taking the little hand mirror from the table. You'll sleep well enough when you deliver those letters. Come, come, Mrs. Aubrey. A good night's rest. Holding the mirror before her face. It's quite time. She looks at herself for a moment, then snatches the mirror from him. You brute, Cayley, to show me that. Then may I be guided by a... Fr a poor old woman? May I? You'll kill me amongst you. What do you say? Paula, after a pause. Very well. He nods his head and goes out rapidly. She looks after him for a moment and calls, Cayley, Cayley. Then she again produces the letters, deliberately, one by one, fingering them with aversion. Suddenly she starts, turning her head towards the door. Ah! Aubrey enters quickly. Paula? Paula, handing him the letters, her face averted. There. He examines the letters, puzzled, and looks at her inquiringly. They are many days old. I stole them. I suppose to make you anxious and unhappy. He looks at the letters again, then lays them aside on the table. Aubrey, gently. Paula, dear, it doesn't matter. Paula, after a short pause. Why? Why do you take it like this? What did you expect? Oh, but I suppose silent reproaches are really the severest. And then, naturally, you are itching to open your letters. She crosses the room as if to go. Paula! 
she pauses surely surely it's all over now all over has my stepdaughter returned then when did she arrive i haven't heard of it you can be very cruel that word is always on a man's lips he uses it if his soup's cold with another movement as if to go need we i know i've wounded you paula but isn't there any way out of this when does aline return tomorrow next week oh why should we grudge aline the little pleasure she is likely to find in paris and in london i grudge her nothing if that's a hit at me but with that woman it must be that woman or another you know that at present we are unable to give aline the opportunity of 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 mixing with respectable people the opportunity of gaining friends experience ordinary knowledge of the world if you are interested in aline can't you see how useful mrs corleone's good offices are may i put one question at the end of the london season when mrs corleone has done with aline is it quite understood that the girl comes back to us? Aubrey is silent. Is it? Is it? Let us wait till the end of the season. Oh, I knew it. You are only fooling me. You put me off with any trash. I believe you've sent Eline away. Not for the reasons you give, but because you don't consider me a decent companion for her. Because you're afraid she might get a little of her innocence rubbed off in my company. Come, isn't that the truth? Be honest. Isn't that it? Yes. There is a moment's silence on both sides. Paula, with uplifted hands as if to strike him. Oh! Aubrey, taking her by the wrists. Sit down. Sit down. He puts her into a chair. She shakes herself free with a cry. Now listen to me. Fond as you are, Paula, of harking back to your past, there's one chapter of it you always let alone. I've never asked you to speak of it. You've never offered to speak of it. I mean the chapter that relates to the time when you were... like Eileen. She attempts to rise. He restrains her. No, no. I don't choose to talk about that time. I won't satisfy your curiosity. My dear Paula, I have no curiosity. I know what you were at Eileen's age. I'll tell you, you hadn't a thought that wasn't a wholesome one. You hadn't an impulse that didn't tend towards good. You never harbored a notion you couldn't have gossiped about to a parcel of children. She makes another effort to rise. He lays his hand lightly on her shoulder. And this was a very few years back. There are days now when you look like a schoolgirl. But think of the difference between the two Paulas. You'll have to think hard, because after a cruel life one's perceptions grow a thick skin. But for God's sakes, do think till you get these two images clearly in your mind, and then ask yourself what sort of a friend such a woman as you are today would have been for the girl of seven or eight years ago. Paula, rising. How dare you! I could be almost as good a friend to Elaine as her own mother would have been had she lived. I know what you mean. How dare you? You say that. Very likely you believe it. But you're blind, Paula, you're blind. You, every belief that a young, pure-minded girl holds sacred, that you once held sacred, you now make a target for a jest, a sneer, a paltry cynicism. I tell you, you're not mistress any longer of your thoughts or your tongue. Why, how often, sitting between you and Aline, have I seen her cheeks turn scarlet as you've rattled off some tale that belongs by right to the club or the smoking room? Have you noticed the blush? If you have, has the cause of it ever struck you? And this is the girl you say you love? I admit that you do love, whose love you expect in return. Oh, Paula, I make the best, the only excuse for you when I tell you you're blind. Eileen, Eileen blushes easily. You blush as easily a few years ago. Well, have you finished your sermon? Aubrey, with a gesture of despair. Oh, Paula. Going up to the window and standing with his back to the room. Paula to herself. A few years ago? She walks slowly towards the door, 
then suddenly drops upon the ottoman in a paroxysm of weeping oh god a few years ago aubrey going to her paula don't touch me paula oh go away from me he goes back a few steps and after a little while she becomes calmer and rises unsteadily then in an altered tone look here he advances a step she checks him with a quick gesture look here get rid of these people mabel and her husband as soon as possible i've done with them Paul. and then then when the time comes for Aline to leave mrs cortelion give me give me another chance he advances again but she shrinks away no no she goes out by the door on the right he sinks on to the settee covering his eyes with his hands there is a brief silence then a servant enters mrs cortelion sir with miss Aline. aubrey rises to meet mrs cortelion who enters followed by Aline, both being in travelling dresses the servant withdraws mrs cortelion shaking hands with aubrey oh my dear aubrey mrs cortelion kissing Aline. Aline, dear papa is all well at home we're shockingly anxious yes yes all's well this is quite unexpected to mrs cortelion you found paris insufferably hot insufferably hot paris is pleasant enough we've had no letter from you i wrote to aline a week ago without alluding to the subject i had written to you upon aubrey thinking ah of course and since then we've both written and you've been absolutely silent oh it's too bad aubrey picking up the letters from the table it isn't altogether my fault here are the letters papa they're unopened an accident delayed their reaching me till this evening i'm afraid this has upset you very much upset me aline in an undertone to mrs cortelion never mind not now dear not tonight eh mrs cortelion to aline aloud child run away and take your things off <sighs> she doesn't look as if she journeyed from paris today i've never seen her with such a color taking aline's hands aline to aubrey in a faint voice papa mrs cortelion has been so very very kind to me but i i have come home she goes out come home to mrs cortelion aline returns to us then that's the very point i put to you in my letters and you oblige me to travel from paris to willowmere on a warm day to settle it i think perhaps it's right that aline should be with you just now although i my dear friend circumstances are a little altered alice you're in some trouble well yes i am in trouble you remember pretty little mrs brereton who was once caroline ardale quite well she's a widow now poor thing she has the entresol of the house where we've been lodging in the avenue de friedland caroline's a dear chum of mine she formed a great liking for aline i'm very glad yes it's nice for her to meet her mother's friends er uh, that young you ardale the papers were full of some time ago he's caroline brereton's brother you know no i didn't know what did he do i forget checked one of those horrid mutinies at some faraway station in india marched down with a handful of his men and a few faithful natives and held the place until he was relieved they gave him his company and the v c for it and he's mrs brereton's brother yes he's with his sister was rather in paris he's home invalided good gracious aubrey why don't you help me out can't you guess what has occurred 
Alice. Young Ardale. Aline. An attachment? Yes, Aubrey. Well, I suppose I've got myself into sad disgrace. But really, I didn't foresee anything of this kind. A serious reserved child like Aline, and a boyish, high-spirited soldier. It never struck me as being likely. Aubrey paces to and fro thoughtfully. I did all I could directly Captain Ardale spoke. Wrote to you at once. Why on earth didn't you receive your letters promptly? And when you do get them, why can't you open them? I endured the anxiety till last night, and then made up my mind. Home. Of course it has worried me terribly. My head's bursting. <sighs> Are there any salts about? Aubrey fetches a bottle from the cabinet and hands it to her. We've had one of those hateful smooth crossings that won't let you be properly indisposed. My dear Alice, I assure you, I've no thought of blaming you. That statement always precedes a quarrel. I don't know whether this is the worst or the best luck. How will my wife regard it? Is Captain Ardale a good fellow? My dear Aubrey, you'd better read up the accounts of his wonderful heroism. Face to face with death for a whole week, always with a smile and a cheering word for the poor helpless souls depending on him. Of course it's that that has stirred the depth of your child's nature. I've watched her while we've been dragging the story out of him, and if angels look different from Aline at that moment, I don't desire to meet any. That's all. If you were in my position, but you can't judge. Why, if I had a marriageable daughter of my own, and Captain Ardale proposed for her, naturally I should cry my eyes out all night, but I should thank heaven in the morning. You believe so thoroughly in him? Do you think I should have only a headache at this minute if I didn't? Look here, you've got to see me down the lane. That's the least you can do, my friend. Come into my house for a moment and shake hands with you. What? Is he here? He came through with us to present himself formally tomorrow. Where are my gloves? Aubrey fetches them from the ottoman. Make my apologies to Mrs. Tankery, please. She is well, I hope? Going towards the door. I can't feel sorry she hasn't seen me in this condition. Aline enters. Aline to Mrs. Cortellian. I've been waiting to wish you good night. I was afraid I'd missed you. Good night, Aline. Aline, in a low voice, embracing Mrs. Cortellian. I can't thank you. Dear Mrs. Cortellian. Mrs. Cortellian, her arms round Aline, in a whisper to Aubrey. Speak a word to her. Mrs. Cortellian goes out. Aubrey to Aline. Aline, I'm going to see Mrs. Cortellian home. Tell Paula where I am. Explain, dear. Going to the door. Aline, her head drooping. Yes. Father, you are angry with me. Disappointed. Angry? No. Disappointed. Aubrey, smiling and going to her and taking her hand. If so, it's only because you've shaken my belief in my discernment. I thought you took after your poor mother a little, Aline. But there's a look on your face tonight, dear, that I never saw on hers. Never. Never. Aline, leaning her head on his shoulder. Perhaps I ought not to have gone away. Hush. You're quite happy? Yes. That's right. Then, as you are quite happy, there is something I particularly want you to do for me, Aline. What is that? Be very gentle with Paula, will you? You think I've been unkind? Aubrey, kissing her upon the forehead. Be very gentle with Paula. He goes out, and she stands looking after him. Then, as she turns thoughtfully from the door, a rose is thrown through the window and falls at her feet. She picks up the flower wonderingly and goes to the window. Aline, starting back. Hugh! Hugh Ardale, a handsome young man of about seven-and-twenty, 
with a boyish face and manner, appears outside the window. Nelly, Nelly, dear. What's the matter? Hush, nothing. It's only fun. Ha, ha, ha. I've found out that Mrs. Cortelyon's meadow runs up to your father's plantation. I've come through a gap in the hedge. Why, you? I'm miserable at the Warren. It's so different from the Avenue de Friedland. Don't look like that. Upon my word, I meant just to peep at your home and go back. But I saw figures moving about here and came nearer, hoping to get a glimpse of you. Was that your father? Entering the room. Yes. Isn't this fun? A rabbit ran across my foot while I was hiding behind that old yew. You must go away. It's not right for you to be here like this. But it's only fun, I tell you. You take everything so seriously. Do wish me good night. We have said good night. In the hall at the Warren before Mrs. Cortleon and a manservant. Oh, it's so different from the Avenue de Friedland. Aline, giving him her hand hastily. Good night, Hugh. Is that all? We might be the merest acquaintances. He momentarily embraces her, but she releases herself. It's when you're like this that you make me feel utterly miserable. Throwing the rose from her angrily. Oh! I've offended you now, I suppose. Yes. Forgive me, Nelly. Come into the garden for five minutes. We'll stroll down to the plantation. No, no. For two minutes. To tell me you forgive me. I forgive you. Evidently. I shan't sleep a wink tonight after this. What a fool am I. Come down to the plantation. Make it up with me. There is somebody coming into this room. Do you wish to be seen here? I shall wait for you behind that yew tree. You must speak to me. Nelly! He disappears. Paula enters. Elaine! You... You are very surprised to see me, Paula, of course. Why are you here? Why aren't you with... your friend? I've come home, if you'll have me. We left Paris this morning. Mrs. Cortellian brought me back. She was here a minute or two ago. Papa has just gone with her to the Warren. He asked me to tell you. There are some people staying with us that I'd rather you didn't meet. It was hardly worth your while to return for a few hours. A few hours? Well, when do you go to London? I don't think I go to London, after all. Paula, eagerly. You... you've quarrelled with her? No, no, no. Not that. But... Paula... Paula... Huh? Aline goes deliberately to Paula and kisses her. Aline? Kiss me. What? What's come to you? I want to behave differently to you in the future. Is it too late? Too late? Impulsively kissing Aline and crying. No, 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 no. Paula, don't cry. Paula, wiping her eyes. I'm a little shaky. I haven't been sleeping. It's all right. Talk to me. There is something I want to tell you. Is there? Is there? They sit together on the ottoman, Paula taking Aline's hand. Paula, in our house in the Avenue de Friedland, on the floor below us, there was a Mrs. Brereton. She used to be a friend of my mother's. Mrs. Cortellian and I spent a great deal of our time with her. Paula suspiciously. Oh! Letting Aline's hand fall. Is this lady going to take you up in place of Mrs. Cortellian? No, no. Her brother is staying with her. Was staying with her. Her brother... Breaking off in confusion. Well? Paula? She rises and walks away. Paula following her. Aline? Taking hold of her. You're not in love? Aline looks at Paula appealingly. Oh, you in love. You. Oh, this is why you've come home. Of course you can make friends with me now. You'll leave us for good soon, I suppose. So it doesn't much matter being civil to me for a little while. Oh, Paula. Why, how you've deceived us. All of us. We've taken you for a cold-blooded little saint. The fools you've made of us. Saint Aline. Saint Aline. Oh, I might have known you'd only mock me. 
Paula, her tone changing. Eh? I, I can't talk to you. Sitting on the settee. You do nothing else but mock and sneer. Nothing else. Elaine, dear. Elaine, I didn't mean it. I'm so horribly jealous. It's a sort of curse on me. Kneeling beside Aline and embracing her. My tongue runs away with me. I'm going to alter. I swear I am. I've made some good resolutions, and as God's above me, I'll keep them. If you are in love, if you do ever marry, there's no reason why we shouldn't be fond of each other. Come, you've kissed me of your own accord. You can't take it back. Now we're friends again, aren't we, Aline, dear? I want to know everything, everything, Aline, dear, Aline. Paula, he has done something that makes me very angry. He came with us from Paris today to see Papa. He is staying with Mrs. Cortellian, and I ought to tell you. Yes, yes. What? He has found his way by the Warren Meadow, through the plantation up to this house. He is waiting to bid me good night. Glancing towards the garden. He is out there. Oh. What shall I do? Bring him in to see me, will you? No, no. But I'm dying to know him. Oh, yes, you must. I shall meet him before Aubrey does. Excitedly running her hands over her hair. I'm so glad. Aline goes out by the window. The mirror! Mirror! Oh, what a fright I must look! Not finding the hand glass on the table, she jumps onto the settee and surveys herself in the mirror over the mantelpiece, then sits quietly down and waits. Aline! Just fancy! Aline! After a pause, Aline enters by the window with Hugh. Paula, this is Captain Ardale, Mrs. Tanqueray. Paula rises and turns, and she and Hugh stand staring blankly at each other for a moment or two. Then Paula advances and gives him her hand. Paula, in a strange voice, but calmly, How do you do? How do you do? Paula to Aline. Mr. Ardale and I have met in London, Aline. Uh, Captain Ardale now? Yes. In London? They say the world's very small, don't they? Yes. Elaine, dear, I want to have a little talk about you. To Mr. Ardale. Captain Ardale. Alone. Putting her arms around Elaine and leading her to the door. Come back in a little while. Elaine nods to Paula with a smile and goes out, while Paula stands watching her at the open door. In a little while. In a little closing the door and then taking a seat facing Hugh. Be quick! Mr. Tanqueray has only gone down to the Warren with Mrs. Cortellion. What is to be done? Done? Done! Done! Something must be done! I understood that Mr. Tanqueray had married a Mrs. Mrs. Jarman? Yes. I've been going by that name. You didn't follow my doings after we separated. No. Paula, sneeringly. No. I went out to India. What's to be done? Damn this chance. Oh, my God. Your husband doesn't know, does he? That you and I... Yes. No. He knows about the others. Not about me. How long were we... I don't remember exactly. Do you... Uh, do you think it matters? His... His daughter! Oh! With a muttered exclamation, he turns away and sits with his head in his hands. What's to be done? I wish I could think. Oh, oh, what happened to that flat of ours in Ethelbert Street? I let it. All the pretty furniture? Sold it. I came across the key of the escritoire the other day in an old purse. Suddenly realizing the horror and hopelessness of her position, and starting to her feet with a hysterical cry of rage. What am I maundering about? For God's sake, be quiet. Do let me think. This will send me mad. Suddenly turning and standing over him. You, you beast, to crop up in my life again like this. I always treated you fairly. Paula, weakly. Oh, I beg your pardon. 
I know you did, I... <laughs> she sinks onto the settee, crying hysterically. Hush. She kissed me tonight. I'd won her over. I've had such a fight to make her love me. And now, just as she's beginning to love me, to bring this on her. Hush, hush, don't break down. Oh, you don't know. I haven't been getting on well in my marriage. It's been my fault. The life I used to lead spoiled me completely. But I'd made up my mind to turn over a new life from tonight. From tonight. Paula. Don't you call me that. Mrs. Tanqueray, there is no cause for you to despair in this way. It's all right, I tell you. It shall be all right. Paula, shivering. What are we to do? Hold our tongues. Hey? Staring vacantly. The chances are a hundred to one against anyone ever turning up who knew us when we were together. Besides, no one would be such a brute as to split on us. If anybody did do such a thing, we should have to lie. What are we upsetting ourselves like this for when we've simply got to hold our tongues? You're as mad as I am. Can you think of a better plan? There's only one plan possible. Let's come to our senses. Mr. Tanqueray must be told. Your husband? What, and I lose Elian? I lose Elian. You've got to lose her. I won't lose her. I can't lose her. Didn't I read of your doing any number of brave things in India? Why, you seem to be an awful coward. That's another sort of pluck altogether. I haven't this sort of pluck. Oh, I don't ask you to tell Mr. Tanqueray. That's my job. Hugh, standing over her. You, you, you'd better. You... Paula, rising. Don't bully me. I intend to. Hugh, taking hold of her, she wrenches herself free. Look here, Paula. I never treated you badly. You've owned it. Why should you want to pay me out like this? You don't know how I love Elian. Yes, that's just what I do know. I say you don't. She's as good as my own mother. I've been downright honest with her, too. I told her in Paris that I'd been a bit wild at one time, and, after a damned wretched day, she promised to forgive me because of what I'd done since in India. She's behaved like an angel to me. Surely I oughtn't to lose her, after all, just because I've been like other fellows. No, I haven't been half as rackety as a hundred men we could think of. Paula, don't pay me out for nothing. Be fair to me, there's a good girl. Be fair to me. Oh, I'm not considering you at all. I advise you not to stay here any longer. Mr. Tanqueray is sure to be back soon. Hugh, taking up his hat. What's the understanding between us, then? What have we arranged to do? I don't know what you're going to do. I've got to tell Mr. Tanqueray. By God, you shall do nothing of the sort. Approaching her fiercely. You shocking coward! If you dare! Going up to the window. Mind if you dare! Paula following him. Why, what would you do? Nothing. I'd shoot myself. That's nothing. Good night. Good night. He disappears. She walks unsteadily to the ottoman and sits, and as she does so, her hand falls upon the little silver mirror, which she takes up, staring at her own reflection. End of the third act. Act four of The Second Mrs. Tanqueray by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fourth Act The Drawing Room at Hyacomb, the same evening Paula is still seated on the ottoman, looking vacantly before her, with the little mirror in her hand. Lady Oread enters. There you are. You never came into the billiard room. 
isn't it maddening kaylee drummel gives me sixty out of a hundred and beats me i must be out of form because i know i play remarkably well for a lady only last month paula rises whatever is the matter with you old girl why lady oriot staring it's the light i suppose paula replaces the mirror on the table by aubrey's bolting from the billiard table in that fashion i thought perhaps yes it's all right you've patched it up paula nods oh i am jolly glad i mean yes i know what you mean thanks mabel lady oriot kissing paula now take my advice for the future mabel if i've been disagreeable to you while you've been staying here i i beg your pardon walking away and sitting down you disagreeable my dear i haven't noticed it dodo and me both consider you make a first-class hostess but then you've had such practice haven't you dropping on to the ottoman and gaping oh talk about being sleepy why don't you why dear i must hang about for dodo you may as well know it he's in one of his moods paula under her breath oh now it's not his fault it was deadly dull for him while we were playing billiards Kaylee drummle did ask him to mark but i stopped that it's so easy to make a gentleman look like a billiard marker this is just how it always is if poor old dodo has nothing to do he loses count as you may say Huck. sir george orgid enters walking slowly and deliberately he looks pale and watery-eyed sir george with mournful indistinctness i'm afraid we've left you a great deal to yourself tonight, mrs tankery attractions of billiards i apologize i say where's all aubrey my husband has been obliged to go out to a neighbour's house i want his advice on a rather pressing matter connected with my family my family sitting tomorrow will do just as well lady oriot to paula this is the mood i hate so driveling about his precious family the fact is mrs tankery i'm not easy in my mind about the way i am treating my poor old mother do you hear that that's his mother but my mother he won't so much as look at i shall write to bruton street first thing in the morning mamma has stuck to me through everything well you know i'll get all old Bree to figure out a letter i'll drop a line to uncle fitz too do shame of the old fella to chuck me over in this manner wiping his eyes all my family have chucked me over lady oriot rising dodo just because i married beneath me to be chucked over aunt lydia the general hooky whitgrave lady signal my own dear sister all turn their backs on me it's more than i can stand lady oriot approaching him with dignity sir george wish mrs tankery good night at once and come upstairs do you hear me sir george rising angrily what be quiet you presume to order me about you're making an exhibition of yourself look here 
Come along, I tell you. He hesitates, utters a few inarticulate sounds, then snatches up a fragile ornament from the table and is about to dash it onto the ground. Lady Oriot retreats and Paula goes to him. George. He replaces the ornament. Sir George, shaking Paula's hand. Good night, Mrs. Tankery. Lady Oriot to Paula. Good night, darling. Wish Aubrey good night for me. Now, Dodo. She goes out. Sir George to Paula. I say, are you going to sit up for all Aubrey? Yes. Shall I keep company? No, thank you, George. Sure? Yes, sure. Sir George, shaking hands. Good night again. Good night. She turns away. He goes out, steadying himself carefully. Drummle appears outside the window, smoking. Drummle, looking into the room and seeing Paula. My last cigar. Where is Aubrey? Gone down to the Warren, to see Mrs. Cortelion home. Drummle, entering the room. Eh? Hey, did you say Mrs. Cortelion? Yes. She has brought Elaine back. Bless my soul. Why? Oh, I'm too tired to tell you, Cayley. If you stroll along the lane, you'll meet Aubrey. Get the news from him. Drummle, going up to the window. Yes, yes. Returning to Paula. I don't want to bother you, only... The anxious old woman, you know. Are you and Aubrey... Good friends again? Drummle, nodding. Hmm. Paula, giving him her hand. Quite, Cayley, quite. Drummle, retaining her hand. That's capital. As I'm off so early tomorrow morning, let me say now. Thank you for your hospitality. He bends over her hand gallantly, then goes out by the window. Paula to herself. Are you and Aubrey? Good friends again? Yes. Quite, Cayley, quite. There is a brief pause, then Aubrey enters hurriedly, wearing a light overcoat and carrying a cap. Paula, dear, have you seen Aline? I found her here when I came down. She, she's told you? Yes, Aubrey. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Not that somebody should fall in love with Aline, or that Aline herself should fall in love. All that's natural enough and was bound to happen, I suppose, sooner or later. But this young fellow, you know his history? His history? You remember the papers were full of his name a few months ago? Oh, yes. The man's as brave as a lion, there's no doubt about that. And at the same time, he's like a big, good-natured schoolboy, Mrs. Cordelion says. Have you ever pictured the kind of man Aline would marry some day? I can't say that I have. A grave, sedate fellow, I've thought about. Ha! Ah, she has fallen in love with the way in which Ardale practically laid down his life to save those poor people shut up in the residency. Taking off his coat. Well, I suppose if a man can do that sort of a thing, one ought to be content. And yet... Throwing his coat on the settee. I should have met him tonight, but he'd gone out. Paula, dear, tell me how you look upon this business. Yes, I will. I must. To begin with, I... I've seen Mr. Ardale. Captain Ardale? Captain Ardale. Seen him? While you were away, he came up here, through our grounds, to try to get a word with Aline. I made her fetch him in and present him to me. Aubrey, frowning. Doesn't Captain Ardale know there's a lodge and a front door to this place? Never mind. What is your impression of him? Aubrey, do you recollect my bringing you a letter? A letter giving you an account of myself? To the Albany, late one night. The night before we got married? A letter? You burnt it, don't you know? Yes, I know. His name was in that letter. Aubrey, going back from her slowly and staring at her. I don't understand. Well, 
Ardale and I once kept house together. He remains silent, not moving. Why don't you strike me? Hit me in the face. I'd rather you did. Hurt me. Hurt me. Aubrey, after a pause. What did... What did you and this man say to each other just now? I hardly know. Think. The end of it all was that I... I told him I must inform you of what had happened. He didn't want me to do that. I declared that I would. He dared me to. Oh, let me alone. <laughs> Where was my daughter while this went on? I, I had sent her out of the room. That is all right. Yes, 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 yes. He turns his head towards the door. Who's that? A servant enters with a letter. The coachman has just run up with this from the warren, sir. Aubrey takes the letter. It's for Mrs. Tanqueray, sir. There's no answer. The servant withdraws. Aubrey goes to Paula and drops the letter into her lap. She opens it with uncertain hands. Paula, reading it to herself. It's from him. He's going away, or gone, I think. Rising in a weak way. What does it say? I never could make out his writing. She gives the letter to Aubrey and stands near him, looking at the letter over his shoulder as he reads. Aubrey, reading. I shall be in Paris by tomorrow evening. Shall wait there at Maurice's for a week, ready to receive any communication you or your husband may address to me. Please invent some explanation to Aileen. Mrs. Tangare, for God's sake, do what you can for me. Paula and Aubrey speak in low voices, both still looking at the letter. Has he left the warren, I wonder, already? That doesn't matter. No, but I can picture him going quietly off. Very likely he's walking on to Bridgeford or Cottering tonight, to get the first train in the morning. A pleasant stroll for him. We'll reckon he's gone. That's enough. That isn't to be answered in any way? Silence will answer that. He'll soon recover his spirits, I know. You know. Offering her the letter. You don't want this, I suppose. No. It's done with. Done with. He tears the letter into small pieces. She has dropped the envelope. She searches for it, finds it, and gives it to him. Here. Aubrey, looking at the remnants of the letter. This is no good. I must burn it. Burn it in your room. Yes. Put it in your pocket for now. Yes. He does so. Aline enters and they both turn, guiltily, and stare at her. Aline, after a short silence, wonderingly, Papa? What do you want, Aline? I heard from Willis that you had come in. I only want to wish you good night. Paula steals away without looking back. What's the matter? Ah, oh, of course. Paula has told you about Captain Armadale. Well? Have you and he met? No. You are angry with him. So was I. But tomorrow, when he calls and expresses his regret, tomorrow... Aline, Aline! Yes, Papa? I... I can't let you see this man again! He walks away from her in a paroxysm of distress. Then, after a moment or two, he returns to her and takes her into his arms. Aline, my child! Aline, releasing herself. What has happened, Papa? What is it? Aubrey, thinking out his words deliberately. Something has occurred. Something has come, to my knowledge, in relation to Captain Ardale, which puts any further acquaintanceship between you two out of the question. Any further acquaintanceship? Out of the question? Yes. Advancing to her quickly, but she shrinks from him. No, no. I'm quite well. After a short pause. It's not an hour ago since Mrs. Cortellian left you and me together here. You had nothing to urge against Captain Ardale, then? No. You don't know each other. You haven't even seen him this evening. 
Father! I have told you he and I have not met. Mrs. Cortellian couldn't have spoken against him to you just now. No, no, no. She's too good a friend to both of us. Aren't you going to give me some explanation? You can't take this position towards me, towards Captain Ardale, without affording me the fullest explanation. Aline, there are circumstances connected with Captain Ardale's career which you had better remain ignorant of. It must be sufficient for you that I consider these circumstances render him unfit to be your husband. Father! You must trust me, Aline. You must try to understand the depth of my love for you, and the... the agony it gives me to hurt you. You must trust me. I will, Father, but you must trust me a little, too. Circumstances connected with Captain Ardell's career. Yes. When he presents himself here tomorrow, of course you will see him and let him defend himself. Captain Ardale will not be here tomorrow. Not? You have stopped his coming here. Indirectly, yes. But just now, he was talking to me at that window. Nothing had taken place then, and since then nothing can have... Oh, you have heard something against him from Paula. From Paula? She knows him. She has told you so? When I introduced Captain Ardale to her, she said she had met him in London. Of course, it is Paula who has done this. Aubrey, in a hard voice. I, I hope you, you'll refrain from rushing at conclusions. There's nothing to be gained by trying to avoid the main point, which is that you must drive Captain Ardale out of your thoughts. Understand that. You're able to obtain comfort from your religion, aren't you? I'm glad to think that's so. I talk to you in a harsh way, Aline, but I feel your pain almost as acutely as you do. Going to the door. I... I can't say anything more to you tonight. Father! He pauses at the door. Father, I'm obliged to ask you this. There's no help for it. I've no mother to go to. Does what you have heard about Captain Ardell concern the time when he led a wild, a dissolute life in London? Aubrey, returning to her slowly and staring at her. Explain yourself. He has been quite honest with me. One day, in Paris, he confessed to me what a man's life is, what his life had been. Oh. He offered to go away, not to approach me again. And you? You accepted his view of what a man's life is? As far as I could forgive him, I forgave him. Oh. Why was it you left us? It hasn't taken you long to get your robe just a little dusty at the hem. What do you mean? Ha! Huh. A few weeks ago my one great desire was to keep you ignorant of evil. Father, it is impossible to be ignorant of evil. Instinct, common instinct, teaches us what is good and bad. Surely I am none the worse for knowing what is wicked and detesting it. Detesting it? Why, you love this fellow. Oh, you don't understand. I have simply judged Captain Ardell, as we all pray to be judged. I have lived in imagination through that one week in India, when he deliberately offered his life back to God to save those wretched, desperate people. In his whole career, I see now nothing but that one week. Those few hours bring him nearer the saints, I believe, than fifty uneventful years of mere blamelessness would have done. And so, Father, if Paula has reported anything to Captain Ardell's discredit... Paula! It must be Paula. It can't be anybody else. You... you'll please keep Paula out of the question. Finally, Aline, understand me. I have made up my mind. Again going to the door. But wait, listen. I have made up my mind also. Ah, I recognize your mother in you now. You need not speak against my mother because you are angry with me. I... I hardly know what I'm saying to you. In the morning. In the morning. He goes out. She remains standing and turns her head to listen. Then, after a moment's hesitation, she goes softly to the window and looks out under the veranda. Aline, in a whisper. Paula! Paula! Paula appears outside the window and steps into the room. 
her face is white and drawn, her hair is a little disordered. Paula, huskily. Well? Have you been under the veranda all the while, listening? N no You have overheard us. I see you have. And it is you who have been speaking to my father against Captain Ardale, isn't it? Paula, why don't you own it or deny it? Oh, I don't mind owning it. Why should I? Ha! Oh, you seem to have been very, very eager to tell your tale. No, I wasn't eager, Aline. I'd have given something not to have had to do it. I wasn't eager. Not? Oh, I think you might safely have spared us all for a little while. But, Aline, you forget. I... I am your stepmother. It was my... my duty to tell your father what I... what I knew. What you knew? Why, after all, what can you know? You can only speak from gossip, report, hearsay. How is it possible that you... She stops abruptly. The two women stand staring at each other for a moment. Then Aline backs away from Paula slowly. Paula? What? What's the matter? You... you knew Captain Ardell in London. Why? What do you mean? Oh! She makes for the door, but Paula catches her by the wrist. You shall tell me what you mean. Oh! Suddenly looking fixedly in Paula's face. You know what I mean. You accuse me? It's in your face! Paula, hoarsely. You... you think I'm that sort of creature, do you? Let me go! Answer me. You've always hated me. Shaking her. Out with it! You hurt me. You've always hated me. You shall answer me. Well then, I've always, always... What? I've always known what you were. Oh, who... who told you? Nobody but yourself. From the first moment I saw you, I knew you were altogether unlike the good women I'd left. Directly I saw you, I knew what my father had done. You've wondered why I've turned from you. There, that's the reason. Oh, but this is a horrible way for the truth to come home to everyone. Oh! It's a lie! It's all a lie! Forcing Aline down upon her knees. You shall beg my pardon for it! Aline utters a loud shriek of terror. Aline, I'm a good woman. I swear I am. I've always been a good woman. You dare to say that I've ever been anything else. It's a lie! Throwing her off violently. Aubrey re-enters. Paula! Paula staggers back as Aubrey advances. Raising Aline. What's this? What's this? Nothing. It... it's my fault. Father, I... I don't wish to see Captain Ardale again. She goes out, Aubrey slowly following her to the door. Aubrey! She... she guesses... Guesses? About me and Ardale. About you and Ardale? She says she suspected my character from the beginning. That's why she always kept me at a distance. And now she sees through. She falters. He helps her to the ottoman where she sits. Aubrey, bending over her. Paula, you must have said something. Admitted something. I don't think so. It's... it's in my face. What? She tells me so. She's right. I'm tainted through and through. Anybody can see it. Anybody can find it out. You said much the same to me tonight. If she has got this idea into her head, we must drive it out, that's all. We must take steps to... What shall we do? We had better... better... What? What? Sitting and staring before him. Aline, so meek, so demure. You've often said she reminded you of her mother. Yes, I know now what your first marriage was like. Oh, we must drive this idea out of her head. We'll do something. What shall we do? She's a regular woman, too. She could forgive him easily enough. But me, 
That's just a woman. What can we do? Why, nothing. She'd have no difficulty in following up her suspicions. Suspicions! You should have seen how she looked at me. He buries his head in his hands. There is silence for a time. Then she rises slowly and goes and sits beside him. Aubrey! Yes. I'm very sorry. Without meeting her eyes, he lays his hand on her arm for a moment. Well, we must look things straight in the face. Glancing round. At any rate, we've done with this. I suppose so. After a brief pause. Of course, she and I can't live under the same roof any more. You know, she kissed me tonight, of her own accord. I asked her to alter towards you. That was it, then. I... I'm sorry I sent her away. It was my fault. I made it necessary. Perhaps now she'll propose to return to the convent. Well, she must. Would you like to keep her with you and... and leave me? Paula! You needn't be afraid I'd go back to... what I was. I couldn't. Shh, for God's sake. We, you and I... We'll get out of this place. What a fool I was to come here again. You lived here with your first wife. We'll get out of this place and go abroad again, and begin afresh. Begin afresh? There's no reason why the future shouldn't be happy for us. No reason that I can see. Aubrey. Yes? You'll never forget this, you know. This? Tonight, and everything that's led up to it. Our coming here, Aline. Our quarrels, cat and dog, Mrs. Cortelion, the Orades, this man. What an everlasting nightmare for you. Oh, we can forget it if we choose. That was always your cry. How can one do it? We'll make our calculations solely for the future. Talk about the future. Think about the future. I believe the future is only the past again, entered through another gate. That's an awful belief. Tonight proves it. You must see now that, do what we will, go where we will, you'll be continually reminded of what I was. I see it. You're frightened tonight. Meeting this man has frightened you. But that sort of thing isn't likely to recur. The world isn't quite so small as all that. Isn't it? The only great distances it contains are those we carry within ourselves. The distances that separate husbands and wives, for instance. And so it'll be with us. You'll do your best, I know that. You're a good fellow. But circumstances will be too strong for you in the end. Mark my words. Paula! Of course I'm pretty now. I'm pretty still. And a pretty woman, whatever else she may be, is always, well, endurable. But even now I notice that the lines of my face are getting deeper. So are the hollows about my eyes. Yes, my face is covered with little shadows that used to be there. Oh, I know I'm going off. I hate paint and dye and those messes, but by and by I shall drift the way of the others. I shan't be able to help myself. And then, some day, perhaps very suddenly, under a queer, fantastic light at night or in the glare of morning, that horrid, irresistible truth that physical repulsion forces on men and women will come to you, and you'll sicken at me. I... You'll see me then, at last, with other people's eyes. You'll see me just as your daughter does now, as all wholesome folks see women like me. And I shall have no weapon to fight with, not one serviceable little bit of prettiness left me to defend myself with. A worn-out creature. Broken up, very likely. Sometime before I ought to be. My hair bright. My eyes dull. My body too thin or too stout. My cheeks rattled and ruddled. A ghost. A wreck. A caricature. A candle that gutters. Call such an end what you like. Oh, Aubrey, what shall I be able to say to you then? And this is the future that you talk about. I know it. I know it. He is still sitting staring forward, 
she rocks herself to and fro as if in pain. Oh, Aubrey, oh. Paula, trying to comfort her. Oh, and I wanted so much to sleep tonight. Laying her head upon his shoulder. From the distance in the garden there comes the sound of Drummle's voice. He is singing as he approaches the house. That's Cayley coming back from the Warren. Starting up. He doesn't know, evidently. I, I won't see him. She goes out quickly. Drummle's voice comes nearer. Aubrey rouses himself and snatches up a book from the table, making a pretense of reading. After a moment or two, Drummle appears at the window and looks in. Da -da -da -da. Ah, ha, my dear chap. Cayley. Drummle, coming into the room. I went down to the warren after you. Yes. Missed you. Well, I've been gossiping with Mrs. Cortellion. Confound you. I have heard the news. What have you heard? What have I heard? Why, Aline and young Ardale. Looking at Aubrey keenly. My dear Aubrey, Alice is under the impression that you are inclined to look on the affair favorably. Aubrey, rising and advancing to Drummel. You've not met Captain Ardale? No. Why do you ask? By the by, I don't know that I need tell you, but it's rather strange. He's not at the Warren tonight. No? He left the house half an hour ago to stroll about the lanes. Just now a note came from him, a scribble in pencil, simply telling Alice that she would receive a letter from him tomorrow. What's the matter? There's nothing very wrong, is there? My dear chap, pray forgive me if I'm asking too much. Cayley, you... you urged me to send her away. Aline, yes, yes. But... but by all accounts, this is quite an eligible young fellow. Alice has been giving me the history. Curse him! Hurling his book to the floor. Curse him! Yes, I do curse him! Him and his class! Perhaps I curse myself, too, in doing it. He has only led a man's life, just as I, how many of us, have done. The misery he has brought on me and mine. It's likely enough we, in our time, have helped to bring on others by this leading a man's life. But I do curse him for all that! My God, I've nothing more to fear! I've paid my fine, and so I can curse him in safety! Curse him! Curse him! In heaven's name, tell me what's happened. Aubrey, gripping Drummle's arm. Paula! Paula! What? They met tonight, here. They... they... they're not strangers to each other. Aubrey! Curse him! My poor wretched wife! My poor wretched wife! The door opens and Aline appears. The two men turn to her. There is a moment's silence. Father! Father! Aline? I... I want you. He goes to her. Father! Go to Paula! He looks into her face, startled. Quickly! Quickly! He passes her to go out. She seizes his arm with a cry. No, no, don't go! He shakes her off and goes. Aline staggers back towards Drummle. Drummle to Aline. What do you mean? What do you mean? I... I went to her room to tell her I was sorry for something I'd said to her. And I was sorry. I was sorry. I heard the fall. I... I've seen her. It's horrible. She... she has... Killed herself? Yes, yes. So everybody will say. But I know. I helped to kill her. If I had only been merciful! She faints upon the ottoman. He pauses for a moment irresolutely. Then he goes to the door, opens it, and stands looking out. End of the fourth act. End of 
the second mrs tanqueray by arthur wing pinero